<clears throat> We're rolling, right? Okay. <clears throat> Let's. Give me a clap. Yeah, I'll give you an action. Action. All right, well. You need to do it for that one. Are you good? No, we're going to leave that in, too. Mm. That's good. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, – first podcast was three three hours and some odd minutes. Mm. So this podcast, I want to talk a lot about dogs and other things. But maybe for those of you who are just tuning in to the podcast for the first time, seeing you for the first time, why don't you give them a little bit about, you know, what you do and who you are and where you're from and – Start with that. Cool. So um, I'm a behaviorist from the UK, based in the Midlands. Um, work kind of uh, a lot of big dogs, guard dog breeds, but all pet dogs, mostly um, companion pet dog work. Um, started on YouTube, trying to spread that message. That exploded. The YouTube stuff went crazy. And yeah, here we are, so doing that good old balance between trying to help people in person and then trying to help people online. Um, yeah, all that good fun. Yeah, and um, I remember the first time that we, when I went to the UK, you and I met, because one of the questions, because we're going to be answering some questions from people who answered questions on, uh, or asked questions on Instagram. And one of the questions was, is how'd you guys meet? And um, we, we met for the first time in person at my first seminar in London. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in this back little like kitchenette type thing, wasn't it? And then I remember I saw you out there and I wanted an opportunity to meet you before because we had been talking via social media for a bit. And I wanted an opportunity to meet you before I went on and talked for, you know, four or five hours. And so that's the first time we officially met. But even before that, I'll tell you, I don't know if I ever told you this, but somebody had... This was probably four or five years ago. Everything's four or five years ago now, it seems. I have such a bad time reference. It literally could have been last year, but it wasn't. Because I remember letting dogs out at my other facility. And I remember getting this notification on YouTube. Because those are like really the only notifications that I'll really look into a bit. And that's one thing that we're going to get into as well for people who are listening who are dog trainers or professionals. Um I think one of the biggest benefits of having Will and I, or Will in general in in, in the room, is kind of going over the YouTube exploration that we've been doing and trying to figure things out on social media and um, something that it's not necessarily I'm saying that we're good at, but I will say that you and I both find it very fascinating and we spend quite a bit of our times um, and we're, we're fond of it too. It's not just we're trying to grow numbers. Like I think you're one of the only people that I've met in the industry that genuinely likes the idea of creating and, and, and understanding the beast of what moves certain things. And we'll get into that, but I was on YouTube and I got a notification that said, I learned about you. I heard about you from a Fenrir canine show or something like that. And I'm always like, Oh boy, you know what? Did, who's this? What did they say about me? And then I went to your page. I just went to YouTube and looked at your page, and I just saw this bearded man, and I was like, "Oh, this guy probably hates me." Mm, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "This guy hates me." I know it. And um, and I didn't ever find like the clip or whatever, but you must have mentioned me at at like some to some degree. Um, I think I can remember. It was probably when I um used to do kind of podcasty Q and A stuff. Um with my wife, Rachel, I think I, if I had to guess, it would be the clip where somebody had asked kind of, uh, what other YouTube channels would I recommend? And I imagine it was, um, you were mentioned in that. So it was probably from that clip. Yeah. So it was like the first time I really saw your face and heard who you were. And, but I think at that point you were Fenrir Mm -hmm. and you weren't really like Will Atherton or anything else. It was just the Fenrir brand. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, that's how we first met. And, um, I remember meeting you into the, uh, kitchen there and that was really cool. And then we've been, you know, friend, friendly ever since. And every time I go over to the UK, specifically this last time, Will had helped me, uh, with, with group class, helped me kind of read the room a little bit, you know, as a professional, it's like, how am I doing out there? Is, is everything okay? Is, are we good? And so that's always nice to, to have. So Will and I have just curated a 
genuine friendship over the years, and um, his wife, uh, Rachel, and him are now here in upstate New York, but you and I just spent three days in Manhattan, two or three days mm -hmm. in Manhattan, which was a lot of fun. Brought you, you brought well. You brought me to a, a Rangers game, but we went to a Rangers game together. And uh, what, what for like you seeing an American sport live? Because I'm sure the same thing for me. Like when I watch soccer overseas or whatever, or football. Sorry, it's it's always like I wonder what it's actually like. So, yeah. how was your experience with seeing like the Rangers up close and personal? Everybody screaming and stuff. It's fun. I think. American sports, because I'm a big fan of American sports anyway, and have been much more. I'm not really a big fan of football or soccer and stuff, but obviously it's such a part of our culture that you can't not be aware of it. But you kind of put, you put on such a fun show. It's not just the the actual game. The, the whole show's more fun. Um, all the crowd cam stuff and the competitions between the periods and stuff. It's just, yeah. It's much more fun. It's much more chill as well. The I went to a few football matches when I was younger, and um, they could be quite aggressive. Um, fans have to be separated into their own stands and stuff. So mm. the fact that there was Winnipeg Jets fans two rows behind us, as soon as when I saw that, I'm like, is that going to be a problem? Because if this was an, an England football match, that that could very well become a problem. And it wasn't. It was chill. Everyone had a good time. And yeah, it's just good fun. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I would assume it's like, I think the MSG itself is just like such a cool place and it doesn't seem like this. It's a stadium, but it's not. It's an arena, but it's like, it almost seems like, I don't know, it's just lit so perfectly where you just feel like you're in this very cool space. Yeah, MSG, that, that's, that was genuinely a bucket list thing for me of when we were like, let's go to the city and we'll hang out for a few days. My wife, she, there was some things that she wanted to do. And she's like, what do you want to do? Genuinely, the only thing I wanted to do, I was like, whatever's on MSG, I don't mind. But Madison Square Garden, growing up watching all the wrestling shows there and boxing stuff, it's, yeah, that was fun. And I don't like the where the big screen is above the ice and there's the Madison Square Garden, oh, Goosebumps Now, sign above the screen. And I had a moment when we just kind of first sat down. I was like, ah, oh, here in MSG, here, yeah, yeah, great seats in MSG. I was like, this is, this is cool. Yeah, all because again, go back because of YouTube. Yeah, They're awesome. Yeah, right, isn't it? It's strange, you know, like, and that's the cool thing about I think, yeah, and it, our wives Taylor and Rachel, we all just kind of like talked for a long time, and it, the the more that we really talked outside of the context of dogs and mm -hmm. outside of the context of being at a seminar or you being at a seminar, you being Will Atherton, or mm -hmm. me presenting my own seminar, mm -hmm. the more we talked, we're like scarily the same mm -hmm. human. Weirdly so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like... I imagine Rachel's laughing over there. Yeah, yeah. she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy. And, 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 it's, and it's cool because it's not only, like I was telling Taylor last night, I'm like, it's so... Um, it's un unlikely that I meet somebody that is as interested at creating stuff as I am, but then they're also in the dog space mm -hmm. and they're also like at a level that we can really get granule about things and, and it makes sense and it be like transitional where it makes sense and it's like useful. And so that's really cool. So yeah, it's crazy how YouTube works and that's why I think in social media in general, it's such a, blessing and a curse and I know that that's probably so over said and it's such a cliche to say but I mean the relationships that you're able to create long term and even for you and I like the people that we're able to help or the people that will message you or email you or see you you know and just say like you've changed everything mm -hmm. and one interesting thing I want to point out is whenever I get excited about something, it's cool to be around somebody that I know thinks the same as me, and I'm going to look, and I'll be, that was cool, wasn't it? Yeah. So when they said, like, uh, congratulations, Madison Square Garden, you've sold out uh, the arena of 18,000-something mm -hmm. seats, and I immediately smirked over you. I go, it's cool to see what 18,000 people mm -hmm. looks like, because when you see a number on a screen, you never really know what that means. And then when you... I just got chills thinking about that. That's something I have to remind myself all the time, because you always... You, you, and the people that are listening that kind of might be aspiring to do the YouTube stuff or the social media stuff, it's, and it's, I think it's the same in any kind of aspect of human nature, isn't it? You have like an aspirational target. And when you're not there, you're like, 
what I would do to get there. And you get to that point, and if that's a view, it's like getting 10K views on average on a video, like, that's insane. And then, but if you drop back, it's then really disappointing. And I have to remind myself sometimes of kind of the views that we're at and subscribers when it got to like half a million. You, I go to, sometimes I genuinely go to Google, not in like a, a weird big headed way, but like type in what that is. And there'll be usually it's kind of from like massive super music shows, but to see that many people in one place, and yeah, when it was like sold out eighteen thousand people, and you can look around and be like, oh, that's what eighteen thousand people looks like, and you can forget when you see that that's just a a number of views on a video, um, and you get wrapped up in that. But to go, oh, that's like how many people watched our videos, or that's in relation to whatever the views are. It's it's crazy. Yeah, wild. It's so far removed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Online versus in person. Yeah, and it's easy to... <clears throat> I think it's easy to be... You know, like, you're like, oh, 10,000 isn't enough, 20,000 isn't enough, 1 million isn't enough, yeah. 100,000 isn't enough. And then when you see 18,000 people in a sold-out arena, you're like, whoa, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get it. I'm going to pop a couple of questions up. Perfect. As we get into this, uh, this is a really good one. So I'm a new trainer. This is from Christina. Actually, it's just underscores Christina. I'm a new trainer. How do you handle self-doubt? It's not easy. We just uh, talked about the imposter syndrome, didn't we? Yeah, imposter syndrome is a huge... That is, I'm usually quite like I'll beat myself up about things I try and be as open and honest about like the, the difficulties and challenges because I know it, it helps a lot of people but the imposter syndrome genuinely is something I'm quite proud of the progress I've made with that back when we did our first podcast that might be a worth a listen if they haven't listened to that because mm -hmm. that was right in the the midst of when I was really struggling with it and it's like what you just said there uh, and obviously you don't have to aspire to have the level of followers that we have to to feel worthy of the difference that you've made if you help one person you've helped one person and for me that self-doubt thing I, I always encourage people just to boil that back down to that question of value did you provide or are you capable of providing value to somebody and is that value uh, at the level or above the expectation that that person has. And obviously in the context of uh, becoming a new trainer, it's quite simple. A client has a problem with their dog or needs help with their dog. Can you help them with what they want? If you can, if the answer is yes, brilliant. Don't worry about anything else or what other people say. That, I would encourage people, should be enough, ideally to remove the self-doubt. Now, if you're going into lots and lots of sessions and you're leaving clients disappointed, well then, the self-doubt is warranted um, and that's an issue and you need to address that and there's many other ways I suppose you could address that but if that person I think can hand on heart say yes when people come to me with a problem I can help them with that problem that's it done that that's what I think it should be boiled back to just that kind of exchange of value um, obviously we can go down rabbit holes I think social media as much as it's what we do I think is so guilty of, of creating those kinds of problems that people struggle with. Um, but I think if people could just kind of remember just to take that step back a little bit and remember what is it we actually are trying to do and it's helping people. Are you helping people? Yes. Or can you help people? Because if you're a new trainee and might have not had your first client yet, but are you capable of helping that first client when you get them? If the answer is yes, well, then you just need to challenge that self-doubt. It'll always be there. You'd be a bit of a narcissist or a psychopath, wouldn't you, if it's not? And it's a good thing, so it'll keep pushing you forward to grow. But it shouldn't be at the expense of stopping you. Um, and I see that so often, so often with, with very talented people that could make amazing trainers, but they let that self-doubt kind of yeah, paralysis by analysis or worried what people might say or if they post stuff, the kind of feedback they'll get or the comments they'll get. And I have to kind of remember like, stop, 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 stop. Can you help someone? Yes. Good. Let's go. Let's do that mm. and put that first and focus on that first and deal with all the other stuff if and when it happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's easy to just I think from I think from this standpoint of the context of I'm a new trainer, how do you handle self doubt? I'll just say that self doubt allows you to get better mm -hmm. because there's there's many sessions where I have self doubt in many different aspects. I could be saying like, Man, the dog's doing great, but the owner's still not getting it. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, yeah. How do I need to do this better? And that's where Every, every session that I've had 
or in most sessions that I've had, there's, oh, there's, and this is just helpful for this individual and maybe others that, and I guess I'm saying this from a point of somebody, not only I've just been doing it for over a decade every day, and it's now my professional on many levels, and I still have self-doubt all the time about what I do, all the time. And I think that self-doubt is, and I guess maybe if we really analyze this question, if maybe Christina thought that you and I didn't have self-doubt, then she wouldn't be answering, asking this question because she would maybe be looking at people that she inspires to be or inspires to be like. And it doesn't have to be dog training related. It could be Michelle Obama or Pink. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying, like, if you're inspiring to be somebody and then you ask them, how do you handle self-doubt? Um, just just know that the people that you know you're inspiring to be and aspiring to be also have it. And so how you know how do you handle it? Is it never goes away? First of all, just and I think that's really helpful. Is like that self-doubt never will go away. Everyone has it to some degree, and you just have to like I think a good point of you either help. It's it's a very basic equation. Mm-hmm. If you have somebody coming in and they're like, and this goes for anything, hey, I want a cup of coffee, and then you go over and you just don't know how to do it, mm-hmm. and you're fundamentally like, I can't, I can't do, I can't work the machine, I don't know what a coffee is, mm-hmm. then that's where you have to say, I'm not going to stand at this counter and, and, and offer that product. Mm-hmm. But I think once you get into it and somebody says, hey, can I have a coffee? And you're like, I just learned the machine. I'm pretty sure I can do this. I'm nervous. I work in this very bougie maybe coffee shop that has all these different bells and whistles or whatever the context is you can transfer this to anything but I think if you're in the game you're always going to trip and you're always going to make mistakes and I think making those mistakes is what's always made me better we had long conversation our poor wives don't have any time to think but I'm sure they're used to it that we've had long conversations. I mean, every moment, even when we went into the bathroom the other day, it was like, we're still talking over stalls and <laughs> we're like washing our hands and talking. Like we, we just crack on so easily about so much. And one of the things that we talked about was, you know, the mistakes that you've made and, and what you've learned from those mistakes. We talked about huge opportunities that nobody will ever know. Um, things that you've done to lose those opportunities or things that we thought we have done to lose those opportunities. And to be honest, like there's, you know, and I think the podcast is the benefit of the podcast. And what I like to do is always be truthful and honest and and like an open book and be vulnerable. Cause that's the only way I learn from other people as well. Like if I'm listening to somebody and they're just kind of saying what they should say to say it or say it to feel or look good. But for me, you know, I recently went through, a couple different opportunities that were like perfect for my career, perfect for what I wanted, perfect for what would have been really great for my future and my brand and it lines up perfect and then it just all of a sudden falls through from the and then we we think like what did I say? How did I say it? Should I have texted or emailed differently? Mm-hmm. And it, and we talked about the levels of those things. That's why I was going to jump in and say so like that self-doubt never goes and I think it's it as you grow in any career or profession it comes with you through the growth and it's good to be pushing yourself out of the comfort zone now for me to go back and look at kind of self-doubt or maybe a again that first client of course it would like I say it'd be weird if you didn't have that self-doubt or early in the career and then you'll get better at it and the more you do it and the more you'll feel comfortable and the self-doubt comes down doesn't it and then you want to push to that next level. And then as you push to that next level, the self-doubt sits there as you're pushing yourself out of the comfort zone. I know the example you're talking about, that's like unfathomable for most people, but that's been step by step of you pushing yourself out of that comfort mm-hmm. zone, but not letting the self-doubt hold you back. And I mean, that's the thing that I want to encourage people with a question like that is you have to kind of step out. And sometimes like you experience, and we both experience, you get kind of smacked down by it and you're like, oh, that, absolutely sucked that was horrible but let's get back up dust off and and go again and you learn from it or if it's a some situations you know you'll never know the answer of why that went that way um yeah you just you just can't let the the self-doubt slow you down because it like i say it will it, it follows you through your career if you have ambitions to grow it uh, and to scale it and move it forward and it's um 
yeah, it's an interesting because I think there's self doubt and there's imposter syndrome, aren't there? And there's a Venn diagram; they sit next to each other, but there's elements of that that's different. Um, and self doubt, in particular, is yeah, it's something that it makes me sad to see when it holds people back. And I'm not like I say, I agree with you. Everybody has it, and it's important for growth, but not at the expense of of slowing of slowing you down. And that's one of the areas I think we're similar in of you see an opportunity and I've almost I've almost jumped into it, even though the self-doubt was there and I'm in the opportunity before it really hits me of like, oh, this is pretty big actually. And now I'm in this thing and I've got to work it out. And But I've seen a lot of people that have had similar opportunities and they did that process before jumping in and then the self-doubt stopped them jumping in. And some of the big things, of, I think when I look back on, like, oh, that was a big leap there. That was a big step forward there. Happened off situations like that. Um, so again, I just encourage people to, if you believe you can do it, like I say, provide the value. Mm -hmm. um, like The coffee analogy is perfect. Um, you just, you've just got to push forward. And there's 100% going to be times you fail, 100%. Mm -hmm. and it'll suck when it happens and you learn from it you deal with it and you grow and you move forward yeah and and i think also too one thing that really helped me out when i was early on not giving up w or having self-doubt because i think they're like closely related where you're like i can't do you know i can't do this mm -hmm. this isn't me was uh deep down in my heart i just knew that this is what felt right mm -hmm. that's always guided me mm -hmm. through life and everything that i've done it's just like that feels right. So I remember just training dogs in the early beginning and just getting whole body goosebumps and really being like, this is something, this is going to be big for me. This is what feels right. And not everybody has that opportunity to make those clicks and to make those like, Oh, cause you have to put yourself into those situations too. It doesn't, sometimes maybe you get lucky and you're at the right place at the right time, but oftentimes it doesn't just I mean, that's very rare, you. actually. I think from the outside, it could look that way. But I think that's very rare that it happens. Yeah, It's that thing of yeah, of not letting the self-doubt stop you from putting in yourself in those situations where then opportunity can arise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, like the levels thing that I was saying earlier is there's levels, you know, like we had this conversation about this opportunity or that opportunity that, you know, I didn't get or you didn't get or whatever. And it's like, if you look back, my big opportunities back then were to be like, you know, maybe getting, you know, getting a write up, uh, in like the local journal yeah. about maybe, a an aggressive dog that I worked with. And now like the levels of my worries have changed so much in my, like, you know, if I were to got some of the, and, and I'm just, and again, I'm just being honest, like, you know, as you grow, I think your levels will mature with you Yeah, naturally. It's mm -hmm. not like if, if I were to like scale back five years and be handed an opportunity that I've missed in the last, you know, six months, I would have fainted. Mm -hmm. I would have said, what? Me? No way. Mm -hmm. Wrong, wrong number, buddy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's levels to those, those self doubts. And, 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 and I say that because I want to ensure to Christina, like it doesn't matter where you go in your career and how you gauge your growth or how you gauge your success you were always going to carry that self-doubt because even when I was living in a tent, homeless, not being able to afford, you know, dinner that night to being able to pay my bills on time now, I've had self-doubt throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. They've just changed and matured with my career growth. But that's kind of what I was saying. So if you now go back for that example, a, a local newspaper wants to write an article, does that read that won't register surely to you the same self doubt it did the first time it happened? You're like, oh, cool, I've done that. I know what that is. I can do that. But when the the next level of opportunity arises, the self doubt's there. It just scales and grows. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it it's just so. Just I guess in short is everyone has self doubt. Yeah. And if they say they don't, they're lying, mm -hmm. and it's part of growing up as a human and it's not even just career is it it's like yeah. being a dad or being a husband or being a manager or a business owner or a colleague or a friend like you're like man I don't know if I'm qualified for this yeah. or I don't know if this is a good idea there's always self-doubt and I think you just have to listen to your your gut that's like been the biggest thing like my dad's always told me that I've had such a good innate ability to like make these decisions executively to say like, no, this is what we need to hammer in and this is going to work. And I think that that comes naturally to some people and other people, they don't, 
it doesn't they don't know how to listen to it maybe yeah i don't know all right that's a good question though um so i'm gonna kind of sc- scroll through these some of these questions um but uh i was gonna ask you in between these types of things is where so right now you have uh, w- so what offerings do you have right now as a as like a canine educator behaviorist professional creator so you have you can work with you one-on-one online i mean i'm i just kind of save this for the podcast because i generally want to know so like what does your ecosystem look like for for kind of in person working with me just like your business yeah how is your business set up right now and what are the things that you're focusing on and what are the things for people out there that you've seen monumental growth and, and how you've handled and navigated through those things as a business so, owner so i think for me it kind of breaks into probably three main categories i've got kind of my the will afton canine center which is my in-person work um or, or kind of online consultations that people can book with me um one of the natural side effects of growing the followings we have is that that demand becomes too high to be able to manage um all of the requests that we come in so that's been a very interesting challenge i really personally like um intensive day programs um so i do a lot of that kind of reactive dog stuff so uh, the dog will get dropped off with me in the morning and i like working the dog throughout the day and then doing the handover consultations at the end of the day so they're kind of the main in-person cases um, that i take on do lots of kind of online stuff with people all around the world which is super fun that's kind of th- that side of things then i also own fenrir canine leaders that's um kind of an e-commerce brand um, mainly focusing on kind of products for dogs and that was always a fun thing and again everything that I've done is is stemmed from YouTube that's why I'm so passionate about YouTube because YouTube changed my life but that stemmed so it kind of started off as like Will Afferton stuff and then it morphed into Fenrir stuff when I launched Fenrir and then it's kind of broken back out but um, Fenrir was just a result of the demand that I was seeing through YouTube comments um, and when things started to grow, the questions, what products do you recommend? What products do you use? And a lot of the answers, I'm like, I don't really recommend any because I've not got necessarily ones I really like. Mm. So it's kind of, well, I'll make some myself. And then I was literally would sew stuff on my, I taught myself how to use a sewing machine. And I was sewing them on our kitchen table and then shipping them out. And then that grew and grew to this big international e-commerce company now. Um, like I said, that's kind of broke off into its own brand now. So it's kind of Fenrir uh, and and me and then I've got my um kind of my academy side so there's the Will Afton Center that's kind of in person and then the Will Afton Academy is the online stuff and that's probably the thing I'm most passionate about at the minute and that's me kind of training other trainers and that's something that so yeah so then that's kind of like the online stuff and I'll kind of come back to that because again a lot of the things my mission statement is something I always kind of come back to and I think it's mission statements quite cliche almost like douchey businessy marketing things isn't it but when i think if you actually look at what a mission statement should be i do think it's important and mine is keep dogs out of shelters and offer euthanasia tables and i always kind of come back to like everything we do has to be pushing towards that goal and kind of the big thing i'm seeing at the minute is that or the big thing i'm working on is that difference between kind of being like reactive solutions to problems or proactive solutions to problems i think kind of the Will Afton Center and like what we do as behaviorists, unfortunately, or for however you see it, is a very reactive industry. We're almost waiting for something mm-hmm. to go wrong, aren't we? And then fixing the problem. Sometimes um, the problems become too bad before we get involved and we don't even get chance to work with these dogs that are then getting euthanized. So that's why I try and split it up into like proactive and reactive. So the reactive side of things, this was something I really struggled with. As things grew online, lots of people would, the amount of people that want my help got bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's just not enough time in the day. And I mean, I know you'll get it, but it's like, I'm going to have to put my dog down if you can't help me. Those things, they crush me. And it, that used to be a real burden that I struggled with, still do struggle with it. So that kind of was my solution to that problem was because I also didn't, didn't have many people to recommend them to. It's not like I wanted to absorb all the business for myself. It's, it's no issue to me to recommend. I just didn't have enough people that I could be like, yep, yeah, they can help you, especially in the UK. In the US, it was much easier. I've got lots of people across the US. I'm like, they're really good. You go speak to them. Um, 
so the, the academy again was kind of a solution to that problem and that's kind of me training other trainers to kind of help the reactive side of the equation and then on top of all that so that so i've got kind of my center Fenrir, the academy and then like the online social media type stuff and the education stuff there i'm leaning to so i'll always do kind of the reactive education stuff but then i like the proactive education which is why i've been focusing a lot on breed education stuff at the minute um trying to help people get it right the first time round, so the problem doesn't happen and then you don't have to go through all the stress of the reactive side of the mm -hmm. stuff now i'm not i'm a realist and understand that we will never be able to fully solve the problem proactively but i'm trying to kind of put a dent in that so they're kind of three slash four main arms of my operation um that i'm trying to balance and a lot of people ask like, how do you do all of that and not easily like, i haven't got an, an easy answer to that question yet of um lots of long hours and lots of stress but building out amazing teams so the team for Fenrir is awesome now um, and they kind of run that beautifully which allows me to really focus on that reactive um slash proactive equation that i'm trying to solve yeah what do you think so like um for listeners and, and i don't even know the answer to this 100 i don't think is like what do you think when you're talking about like your in-person stuff because i know that the uk it seems is there just not a lot of dog trainers or is there just not a lot of dog trainers that understand boundaries and punishment and mm -hmm. you know can really make a dent in some of the more reactive cases that we see that's the case there's there's um there's not many there's lots of dog trainers loads you won't you won't struggle to find one you'll struggle to find ones that will take on advanced cases um not even to get into the politics of of dog training but it would if you approach the dog trainer with a reactive german shepherd if you don't know who to look for or don't have access to someone like me who can point you in the right direction of who to reach and you're just kind of cold calling people in your local area, the likelihood is that you'll just be turned away of I won't work with those dogs and people find themselves at a loss. Then obviously they go to YouTube and Google and come across me or you. And if it's me in the UK and they're in the UK, that's where I think I get those like, I've tr like no one will help me. You, you ha you're the only person I know to help. Um, and it's getting much better. It's something I'm, I'm very proud of, of really trying to drive that forward in the UK. Um, and we, we've helped a lot of people go from uh, the lady that asked the question earlier to now working full time very successfully, kind of, and helping people on that journey has been really rewarding. Um, and it's, it's getting much better. But that's, um, yeah, it's something when I come to the States, when I talk to you guys, I think the access to it here of to genuine solution focused training um that's actually capable of providing good results is more easily accessible here than it is in the uk but that is getting much better like many things i think we're just a little bit behind um, the curve with lots of things um but the, obviously i know the politics is is very much here as well but um i think my impression and from my research and stuff it's i think it's more extreme in the uk um but it's, it's getting better. Good. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like your whole business is really based off of uh, being proactive mm -hmm. instead of reactive. So like I say, the, my work with dogs is, is always the cases that I choose to work with are always very reactive, not kind of reactive in terms of the behavior, but like the one on one cases, you mean? Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a problem and I'll come in and help the problem. So when I say reactive, that's kind of what I'm referring to, not a reactive dog. Um, like, yeah, you, you've waited until there was a problem and now we need to fix it. So my in-person, so I, I don't do any kind of puppy training. I don't do any, um, obviously, obedience training is, is a part of my behavior modification and, and intervention schedules, but it's all behavior modification work that I do in person. But that's what I'm saying is that I think to genuinely make a difference long term to that mission statement, always going back to that of keeping dogs out of shelters and off the euthanasia table, I don't think the answer to that question is just waiting for dogs to go wrong and then having more trainers out there able to help. Because I think even with that, even if that was every dog trainer was able to help waiting for something to go wrong, because if what has gone wrong is that dog has bit a child, it doesn't matter whether that dog can come to me and I can help that dog's already been put down. Whereas if that person had chose a, a 
breed that was more suitable for their skill and lifestyle, that problem wouldn't have occurred. Or if they'd have trained it properly in the first place, that problem wouldn't have occurred. So I'm trying to do as much as I can there with the understanding of there's always going to be dogs though that fall through those cracks. And then um, I'll try and help as many of those as I can. And if I can't, I'll help as train as many trainers who can then help mm -hmm. those um, those dogs. And from a from a business standpoint, what has been like the biggest, what would you say for anybody out there that's uh, been a trainer forever or just starting off, what has been the biggest uh, financial advantage or financial gain in your business when you stop when you stopped one thing and switched to this or you decided to offer this or you decided and it doesn't have to be like oh I'm this is when you know we got successful I mean just like there was parts in my career where I was doing the same thing over and over again until I like had a hiccup and I'm like why am I doing this mm -hmm. has there been anything in your career that you're like when I started this that's where everything changed in your career has there been offerings or things like there's, that there's been lots of those and this is it's a great question and i'm not shying away from it i'll absolutely i'm an open book i'll answer great these you're questions. not going to answer it are you okay no no but i think it's important though because i've having helped trainers there's there's trainers that i've helped with that exact thing and then they've taken those steps to scaling business or trying to make more money and then gone i wish i hadn't done that again you wish you hadn't done no, I don't, but there's other trainers out there that might listen to this conversation. And again, I'm, I'm going to come on. I, I promise you I'll answer that question. But I just always encourage people to ask yourself, why do you want to? And if you do, cool, let's have the conversation and I'll help. But there's been people that have been like, it looks really cool what you do. It looks really cool what Tom does. I want to do that. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's see what that strategy is. And then you peer behind that curtain and you're like, oh, that was not what I thought that whole, I thought you were just messing around on YouTube, making cool videos and then making loads of money off it. And it's like, that, it is a whole beast. And obviously, you know, and I think it's, um, we are very entrepreneurial people and really enjoy that challenge of, of scaling things and growing things and, and, and helping people at scale. But as we know that that's, it's a, it's a whole new beast when you step into it. So that's kind of a bit of advice I give people. I've got a really good friend who I'm thinking of. I literally had that conversation this morning with him and he um, was talking about kind of frustrations around social media. And again, I'm like, I've got loads of advice I can give you, but like, why, what is it you're trying to achieve? If, and he's like, I've just, because he's fully booked. And I'm like, cool, well, what's next then? Or are you just really happy being fully booked and maybe you could charge a little bit more money if you have higher levels of demand and stuff? And that was a bit like, oh, and he's like, I hadn't really thought about that. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, think about that first. And then if you're like, no, I really want to scale business and grow, then um, yeah, social media is, is a no-brainer. That was, and YouTube in particular, um, I think if you want to scale and grow business in the dog industry and be able to have large amounts of impact at scale, YouTube was, has always been and is now the TikTok's growing really well and Instagram's doing good. Nothing for me comes close to what YouTube has provided for me um, business-wise uh, and ability to help-wise and build brand-wise, all of those things. YouTube is number one. Um, kind of financially obviously like an e-commerce company is always uh, uh if you've got that traffic that has been big and that's a good example of myself like so Fenrir is very it's a very successful business it is also the most stressful thing I've ever been a part of I've worked with really stressful dogs I've done many stressful things the special needs education I used to work with was incredibly stressful nothing has come close to the stress that running an international e-commerce company provides and you can look at the numbers and stuff and be like that's amazing I want to do that um, like I say I've built out a team to now run that so that I can step away and focus back on this the this kind of proactive reactive thing I've been putting all my time on so yeah, YouTube is the thing that for me had the biggest impact, still has the biggest impact, and I still love, um, and I'm really passionate about it. Kind of financially, uh, running an e-commerce company is um, it's no secret. If you crack that puzzle and do it well, it, it's very good. But again, I would just encourage people to really um, question why, uh, and if and if running an e-commerce company sounds like that would be a dream for me, like cool, sweet. 
And to define e-commerce, that would be selling product online. Yeah, selling products online, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one thing that has helped me out immensely, and it sounds like just by hearing the amount of stress that that was and what you did for a solution was delegation. Because mm -hmm. that's one thing that I always tell any trainer or anybody, like it doesn't matter how good you are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how viral you know, people are seeing your stuff. It doesn't matter if you can solve dog reactivity by snapping your fingers like Wednesday Adams. You have to be able to scale in order to help other people. Or if that's your goal, that's what you have to do. And delegation was really hard for me in the beginning because I created this company that, and like you, we talked about, you know, like when times were rough and, um, you know, we just didn't have anything. And when you create something that puts food on the table for your family, you're really careful and you care a lot about who touches it mm -hmm. and who's around it and who's responsible for it. When you've grown it from nothing as well. Like, yeah. I always still like, and I refer to like family is my baby. And that, that's, it's a skill that I've developed over the last couple of years. I st so I was kind of founder and CEO of that and do, running my center and all the other things. And then I brought, a CEO, I stepped back from that and brought a CEO into Fenrir and went, well, that was the best decision I ever made because they're a better CEO than I am. I'm a good, I'm really good with dogs. I'm, I love making content. I think I'm quite good at making content and helping people. I'm a good educator. That's kind of what my degree and skill set is in, relaying information that's easy to consume. I don't know how to do, mm -hmm. manage logistics of shipping containers to six different massive warehouses around the world and the laws and legalities and import and ugh, it's hmm. madness. Mm -hmm. And that went from me sewing some collars and, and leads on my kitchen table to trying to work out shipping containers internationally. And yeah, it's just, um, again, like I say, if you looked at it from the outside, it's, I'm, I'm certainly not complaining, mate. It's, it's been very good. Um, and it's allowed me to achieve the things I've been able to achieve and still want to, but it's, um, Again, I would just encourage people just to um, just to think deeply about why you want certain things, especially with finances. Like, I'm not shy to talk around the finances and stuff. Like, it's it's been good, and it's easy to say when you don't. You know, I, well, I was, we were broke as you can be five, six years ago. It was, and you think that it will solve all your problems, and there's certain things that are great about it. But it's like that more money, more problems thing. It's it's real and I know that's easy to listen to him like, oh woe is you it's but you just have to I kind of really encourage people to ask like I think for me I, that's why I was referred to kind of like for me I, there's like a bell curve for me of things got better up until like six figures and then after that it didn't really change so and that's something I encourage for dog trainers because I do think that if you're a successful dog trainer and can provide that high value service we were talking about earlier that helps with the kind of imposter syndrome that that's an and I've proven that now. I've helped people get there that don't have all these other things like we do with the online stuff. And they've been able to achieve that kind of income. And it's like, that's really nice. And as long as you're now not wasting it all on Lambos and Gucci and stuff, you can live a very comfortable life. And that removes stress. And I found beyond that, if you're just trying to like remove stress, it doesn't really do that much. So I kind of really right. try and encourage people to... I think people should talk about money more. I think in the dog industry, people should talk about money more. I mean, there's a there's a stigma of if you're ambitious financially or as a business person, you don't really care about the dogs and we know it's nonsense. And my thing is because it makes it sustainable for people as well. I'm sure you've met dog trainers that have been doing it for years and they're just burnt out. And they're like, they've, and it's not that they still love it and they love working with dogs, but they're just stressed mm -hmm. all the time because the, they're in that kind of race to the bottom financially. Of, I've got to be cheaper than this other person in my area and stuff. And it's been really rewarding to help those people flip that script and be able to kind of get that. Oh, I don't have to do this many consults every week just to cover rent and then have nothing left afterwards. And it's just making me and my life miserable. It impacts relationships. And so I think people should in the industry should aspire towards that but it's not necessarily um something i've learned and something I'm, I'm still working on now of kind of managing that relationship between the opportunities we get which naturally comes from growing social media doesn't it when you start getting the numbers we've got opportunities come and they're exciting opportunities and you want to take them and like we talked about earlier we're quite ambitious so like yeah let's 
doing some of them work it's amazing some of them don't you're like oh why didn't that work and yeah one thing I've learned is um yeah providing that it's balance isn't it it's balance with everything and uh, I think people just need to be more honest about trying to find a better way to not a better way to phrase it but the right way to phrase it of just um what is it you want and then work towards that. Mm-hmm. Um, and if what you want is to build a business and, and sell it for a billy, sweet. I'm sure there's ways that you can do that and I might be able to help with a little bit of getting that started. Um, and maybe there's a part of me that with Fenrir, I was like, oh, that's, it could, it could go that way. And um, yeah, now I'm like, I can't think of anything worse now of, of doing that it would provide no that's what I'm saying it would provide no extra value to me and my life and my family it would just take me away from my family more it would make me more stressed Mm -hmm. it would make me more unhealthy um and any of those additional financial benefits to what I have now would wouldn't bring me anything there's yeah just being honest like I think you're just being honest with yourself about what you want like if you want if you want numbers on a screen, then you have to be honest with yourself that that's really what you're looking for. Yeah. Or if you want numbers in the bank, mm-hmm. or both, because mm-hmm. I find that all the time too. Is I I will one thing that I haven't like one service I haven't been able to really offer that we get requested probably the most is helping other dog trainers mm-hmm. scale a, a brand and develop a business because there's many different people who have much more skill than me and you and anybody else but they don't they either they don't know how to run a business they don't know how to start it or so so I think a lot of people really struggle with with that is there they they could be the best dog trainer on the planet but they can't pay their bills and that's just a shame that for me is and that that's a it's a really good point because I think that's where a lot of the negativity would come from of maybe people that are more in our position with it and like you say and I'm a better dog trainer than you I will I'm like yeah you probably are like cool good and I would like like they're the kind of people I want to learn from and stuff and it's but I think when you go from dog trainer to professional dog trainer when you put that word professional in front of it with that that is literally the definition of it we're bringing money into the equation and then um so to say that it doesn't matter is just a lie and I think it's just a, a way and I understand it must be frustrating if you're in that position where maybe you're hyper skilled in the the dog trainer element of Mm -hmm. it but you're lacking the skill in the professional element of it it must be then frustrating to see people that do have the kind of the skill in the professional element of it but that's you can tough love you can bitch and moan about it but it's not going to change like that that's just the way the world works it's um you just have to learn those skills and the way you can learn the the dog trainer side of the equation skill set you can learn the professional business side of the skill set yeah 100 percent. and i one thing that's interesting too is um you know just so people who are listening that are dog trainers and whatever you know it, it almost seems too that i have found that the bigger you get on social the less you know it seems to the general public or at least in the ecosystem of the professional dog trainers world like your our peers and our colleagues it seems like oh you're just the youtube guy yeah yeah or you're the see when i started and when you started i would assume i know that when i started it was kind of like i i remember being so self conscious because when i started youtube there was not there was like maybe a couple other dog trainers on youtube really hitting it and really trying to make um, a name for themselves. And then I kind of like moved through the ranks um, organically and worked my booty off to really get out there and help as many dogs as I could. So I I took like my work ethic and I put it into format. I said, if we're going to train six dogs a day, we're going to film four of them. We're going to put them out tomorrow. And I remember there was no short form. So there wasn't TikTok. There wasn't reels. There wasn't shorts. There wasn't anything. It was just you had to create good YouTube, like kind of like the OG figuring out youtube type thing of like you glory g- days yeah of like you just kind of and it just like the this this um for those of you who are listening i just did like some sort of casino like what is that called slot machine. slot machine right and you put out a video and you hire seo google analytics people to help you with your keywords and and you know and and now it's so much different where everyone has some sort of platform mm-hmm. where like we're not and and i'm just being honest that back then let's say 
five, six years ago, seven years ago ish, you know, and I was like recording and putting out and recording and putting it out to help other dog owners. And I started, and I just noticed that like there were two different, um, observations of me it was like oh that's the guy from youtube at the time or it was like oh that guy is really or it's like and it it was weird um and then as i kind of scaled up it just became like that's a youtube dog trainer yeah. i'm a well yeah i'm a dog trainer but i also really enjoy helping people and i also really enjoy the process of youtube mm -hmm. and it almost seemed like the bigger i got number wise right mm -hmm. and when i say the bigger i got i only mean that in a sense of like when, when you mention a dog trainer's name and a group of other dog trainers, what is the likelihood of m the majority of those people knowing who you are or what you've done or what your face looks like on a YouTube thumbnail? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about like Joe that lives in Albuquerque that has his own um, whatever. I'm, I'm just talking at like scale, mm -hmm. like growing a I, – I should say brand, growing a brand more than – anything else because that's really what it was and it continues to be for you and I is growing a brand that's sustainable mm -hmm. that also has many different products and courses and consulting and all these different in-person things but that's what it I there was a point in my career where I just was like okay so the moment I get to a certain point where there's people on reddit talking about me and there's people on dog training forums talking about me whether it's good good right or bad it was like the the more content I put out and the more views that I had in some of my videos, the more I, I was dismissed. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because on any other platform, it would almost seem the exact opposite. It's like Peter McKinnon or Casey Neistat or David yeah, Dobrik yeah. or Logan Paul would mm -hmm. put out a banger after banger after banger and people would be like, they know how to do things. It was almost like the moment you cross this point of like people knowing who you are in every forum and whatever, it, you immediately, once you gain credibility on the internet, you were dismissed professionally. And I, th I think there's a couple. I have a couple of thoughts to that. And I think the first, a few thoughts. <laughs> the first one is I think it's easy for people to punch up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And like if me and you were doing that to people with smaller followings, so you kind of they refer to that as like punching down. Um, that's that's a terrible look. It's considered bad, isn't it? But when that comes the other way, when people are punching up, it's part of it. And nowadays it's easy views and easy views is easy dopamine. And I get it. it, it that's part of it. So I think that's just natural, I think. And, and, it, and it stems from kind of what I was saying a minute ago of, um, I'm going to... I'll leave that because I'm going off on a waffle fest if I go down there. Then the, <laughs> this, uh, Then the second point is, and this is something that I think is really... I would almost challenge you on that. I think people in the industry, trainers do that. I'm not convinced that the the people who are actually trying to help believe that. And I think that's a, a an easy thing to focus on. And I think... Um, so you mean like pet owners yeah. would not do something like this that? This is something... Yeah, I think pet owners... Would, I know for a fact they, they look up to us and, and our content's been incredibly helpful for them, which is how it should be. And this is, again, when I'm kind of in my academy stuff, kind of teaching trainers that want to kind of dabble into the social media world, I think it's a mistake that loads of trainers make is, is either A, making content for other trainers or for the approval of other trainers or focusing on what other trainers think about their content and completely forgetting that the point right. should be providing value to the, the the people we're actually trying to help. Other trainers don't need our content and maybe, and I feel like my content, I keep it quite simple because I think the basics are important and I think that's where, and again, I, I don't work in competition dogs or sporting dogs and stuff. It's not, I want to help pet owners with pet dogs and the information that I think they need is is basic fundamentals delivered in a way that's entertaining easy to understand and easy to digest so that's kind of what I focus my content on that to other trainers um it's, it's not for them there's yeah. not it's so whether they want to criticize that or not and then you're, you're just the youtube guy just spitting basics I know loads more than that so yeah cool but it's not for you. It's yeah. my, my targeted audience is the person that's just got their first dog. Thought it'd be a great idea to get a Corso at 21 years old. Now it's six months and becoming a monster. I'm like, oh, let's, I want my content's for you. Let's try and stop that dog from being another one. 
back to my mission mm-hmm. statement of going to a shelter or being euthanized and and I think that's and I'm I say I say that to kind of almost challenge you on that thought process a little bit but from the perspective of I've been there and done that and still do that like it, it hurts sometimes especially when it's peers it's like I would hope that they would understand that and get that and a lot of them don't mm-hmm. or like I say it's easy mm-hmm. to punch up and that kind of online now especially in short form that kind of drama stuff it works it performs well it gets good views and once you do that and get that taste of views and stuff and what comes from that is then easy to want to kind of continue to repeat that um at least that's what i tell myself of like yeah. my, it's not for them my content isn't for them my content's for people that need help and that's why i remember because when you get the nice feedback from the people who you've actually helped like, cool good because that that's yeah. what it that that was the purpose um as much as it can sting sometimes when people that you would be a peer or that if i just kind of remove all the nonsense of kind of social media aside and just watch work like yeah you're awesome um that what i would like that relationship to be it's it's a shame that people like that can have that impact but in terms of um i, I think that's a small percentage of yeah. the big picture yeah i would agree i would agree i just i just remember that when i was starting off on youtube mm-hmm. i would literally like and still to this day it's i've i've i think you know i'm just be I, i'm you know, like you said like i I, I agree on all that. I, I think that that's a good perspective to look at it is, and that's kind of what I was saying is it almost seemed like in the industry, and I think you and I are really just over the idea of trying to mold into what the dog training industry yeah. would like. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, and again, we had that conversation of we're in, we're more interested in at a macro scale instead of being right. We just want to help. Yeah. And it, that's what I was saying. It's like when I first started off, I was so like, that. that's what I was saying is like when I'd see a guy like you make a video about me or mention me, I'm like, this guy's going to hate me. And I remember when I get invited on podcasts and stuff in my early careers, I was like, I don't want to walk into the lion's den here and like mm-hmm. people be like, son, do you understand how long I've been training yeah. dogs? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you something about what you've been doing wrong there on the internet, teaching these people how to do these things the wrong way, you know? And I always was like skeptical and, and imposter syndrome and self doubt and all these things. And I think now I've, I've just built up this armor mm-hmm. of understanding exactly that, that, you know what? It's 99 to one. Mm-hmm there's one person that's like, that's not how you train a dog. And I'm like, but do you understand that you literally just watched the video documented with not a hologram or a fake person or an actor? It was an individual that came in that said that I need help with my dog. And if things don't change, this dog's either going to be euthanized or we're going to have to get rid of this beloved dog. And within a couple of days, they leave here emotionally crying with a dog that not only that they say on camera or on the video is like, we've had a good experience. My dog is better but they're watching the dog better. Mm-hmm. So ha- having somebody else come in and say like, that's not the way to do it. You're like, well, that's just subjective then mm-hmm. because there's literally evidence in front of your face yeah. and times, and- times a hundred mm-hmm. that, it, that actually is, that is, they are okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to empathize with those people, like, I, I get it. It must suck if they've been doing it for 20, 30 years and then we come onto the scene and, achieve what we've achieved and I, I i i would guarantee i guarantee the people the people that you mentioned like the peter mckinnons of the world I, I, they they're 100 percent they'll get it as well people that have been in big time production companies for decades and then yeah they hear of this guy that's just come on that's not been doing it for five years ten years and who are they and they don't know anything and they hear that he's grown multi-million dollar companies and yeah I get it. that must I, I i do i empathize with it um yeah, and I, and I also think, too, that that's one reason why I, I – and I've been saying this for years. Uh, I do not get into the drama of what other dog trainers think of one another because I know how it feels for somebody else mm-hmm. to look at me and say, you don't know what you're doing and you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And that I know how that feels. Yeah. And, you know, I go – I'm old school with, like, two wrongs don't make a right. Mm-hmm. And that's, like, a big place in my life right now where I'm never going to do something like that to somebody else because I know how it feels. I'm just going to produce content for the world. And if it helps people, great. And if it doesn't help you, move on. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's how you have to do it. And lead with love and kindness. Yeah. And empathy. But it's how much hell have we gone through to get to that yeah. state of mind. Am I right? Like 100%. And, and, again, that's where – 
it stops people. It stops the, the self-doubt, the imposter yeah. syndrome. And I get it. And it's it's not something I would wish on people. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, my wife's just sat over there. There's, she's the person whose shoulder I have to cry on when you have those real, those ones you've got your armor up and for some reason one just, just got through and it's chinked through and um, days to it's, what difficult. gets, what get? I'll tell you, I'll let you think about it maybe for a second, but I want to tell people and maybe ask you like what one thing that still gets through my armor, like one of the only thing that gets through my armor these days, because it's taken 10 years of living on the internet and caring a lot about what we do and being so, you know, I, I think on our podcast, there's something that I've realized what had happened to me and I've realized a word for it. Absolutely for sure. If anybody's listening to this podcast that had listened to Will and I's original podcast last year or some of my other podcasts, is I always talk about a story about when I was in high school, I would always think about how the person would feel when other people would make fun of them. Mm -hmm. And I would try to get in with them and I would be the person in the school that the principal would pull aside and say, hey, you know, this person's having a really hard time. They just moved here from Glens Falls or from this other place. Do you mind just kind of looping them in? And I was that person. I was that trusted person within the administration that would be that person. And I would do it overly will willingly and I remember just I love talking to strangers and fr kind of freaking them out I'd be sitting next to somebody I didn't know and I remember I get such joy out of looking at them like what'd you have for dinner last night and they'd be like what because I was so interested like when I went home and but there was one time where like I know that when I get into my car and my dad or my mom picks me up or I get home from school and I throw my book bag on and I walk up the stairs and now having a son myself mom and dad would be like how was school buddy mm -hmm. And if I ever would like got made fun of or picked on, and I'll be honest, like there was times in life like everyone else that happened, but I was such a people person that I was friends with like every group. And and back when I was in high school, it was very, and still is, I'm sure. But I just remember thinking of like the person walking down the hallway, having a bad day, having to go home and your mom and dad loves them an immense amount. Like you love your children and I love banks and imagine looking at them and saying, how was school, buddy? And then them looking directly at their parents that love them more than anything in the world. And they say, like, I got picked on today. Or I got a slushy dumped on my head. Or I got shoved into a locker. Or somebody pulled down my pants. Or, like, whatever kids savagely do. And I realized that empathy is the word for that. And I never knew that. Mm -hmm. So I remember, I, I don't know if it was on our podcast, but I've mentioned it on last year's podcast over and over again that my point is, is working with dogs, I have so much empathy and passion combining into what do I do because here's a dog, like what you and I do is there's an owner and there's a family that decide to typically go out and get a dog, whether they adopt it, they foster it and they fail or they buy a dog and they're like, their whole family is loving up on this dog and I, I could just see like Christmas morning and I can see like cute little things on Easter and whatever, like just they're part of their family. And then something happens or, and this is you and I, right? So your company and there's other people out there and in my company, they work with the basics, the puppy stuff and it's the foundation, excuse me. But what you and I really focus on is when there's a problem, what do we need to do? And, and there's a spectrum of like a killer and like an anxious mess. And I just imagine those people coming in and the kids are at home like, oh, good luck, buddy. Do good in school. Like good, do good in training because the owner, the mom and dad might be like, I don't think we can keep Roscoe anymore, guys. He just bit the neighbor or whatever the case is. And then I have this and you have this innate Ness that allows us to work with dogs and understand them and read them like a, a guitarist that picks up the guitar and is much more artful than you or I or at least me uh, or any other art form where you just pick something up and you're a natural and you and I have that with dogs and then I meet with those people and you know we get emotional with one another and we get vulnerable with one another and I help them out and everything has changed for them they go back and they report to the kids, yeah, you know, this was great. Will was amazing. He showed us these things and he taught us how to use this collar, which helps us because we don't know what we're doing to control this dog and vice versa and all these different things. And, every, and everything is kind of happily ever after. And we've had thousands of those stories. And then there's somebody out there that's like, that's not how you do it, mm -hmm. son of a bitch. Yeah. And you're like, what? It's so weird, right? And that's what it was for me in the beginning is I would make these videos and I would put it out there and it was this 
it was this like, don't worry, internet. I'm going to give you something good to talk about. Mm -hmm. Then fast forward 10 years and you're like, now I have to talk about the armor I've put together to, to stop people from telling me not to help this family. Yeah. Isn't that wild? It's crazy. But you're, the word, empathy. Yeah. It's the most beautiful and important trait that is wildly undervalued and um, isn't there in a lot of people. I was talking to you that before I moved into the dog stuff, I spent nearly a decade working with special needs kids and the the special needs type of children I worked with were social, emotional, mental health difficulties. And my job was to create kind of bespoke behavior intervention programs for these kids and try and help them navigate back into mainstream education. And we'd have to do kind of these emotional needs scales, assessments on the children. And by far and away, the uh, the outlier was empathy. And the stuff that those children would go through would result lots of trauma and horrible things and terrible kind of upbringings and family dynamics would result in a woeful lack of empathy. Uh, and a lot of the behavior modification protocol and plan that I would have to do in order to have them develop in their emotional needs to be able to reaccess mainstream education was to develop empathy from like zero to a little bit because a little bit is way better than zero. And it's something that that experience taught me the importance of it, but also how common it is for people to have very little of it. And um, it like smiling ear to ear, listening to you tell that story. So that's, I don't know if people have told you that, or expect, that's such a beautiful thing to have, mm. for you to have developed that. I've got goosebumps. For you to have developed that at that age, and it being the person in school with high, people work on that all their life and don't develop that level of empathy. And if you're describing it as imagery in your mind, yeah, it was. You are literally you can picture yeah. that person. That again, it's good. It's that's beautiful mm. to have that level of empathy for other people. Is um, that like I, say, I was talking about like love, kindness, and empathy because they're the three things. I think they, they create that like them, that, that Venn diagram. But love and kindness is amazing, but it, without the empathy piece of the puzzle, you can't administer love and kindness effectively that allows it to register because without being able to put yourself in that other person's shoes, you can't understand what type of love or kindness is required. And we that's kind of at the big macro level. We take it down to a consultation with a client and a dog. Again, that's where you have the, the, the massive levels of success is because you're stood there empathizing with them. You're literally transporting yourself into their head of how do they feel right now and it's like, this isn't about me as me or you as Tom Davis. This is about this person. And how can I take my skill and expertise and deliver that in the most valuable way to them by utilizing empathy? Um, and being able to do that in person is one skill set. Being able to do that through content is next level. And I think that's why it hurts so much because you're sat there empathizing with viewers and then this person comes in with frankly very little or no empathy for you or for the viewers because it's just quite a narcissistic standpoint for them of this should be about me because I'm a better dog trainer. Mm. This isn't, so this is about me. This isn't about you who made the content and it's not about the people this content was made for. I'm offended because this has made me feel bad. So mm. therefore I'm gonna lash out with this comment and unfortunately that's, it's rife in people, um, whether it's more so in the dog industry. Sometimes I've felt that that's the case. I've not been in enough industries to know for sure, but um, it's a beautiful thing. And I think the dog, and that's a common theme. When I meet other people that like dog trainers that have had massive success and ones that have had success that doesn't really make sense. And I'm sure you know the ones like they grew really quickly and you speak to them and you like you get to know, I'm like, oh, you're, you're a person with high levels of empathy and you're a person that cares about other people uh, and you've taken that skill set and packaged it with your experience and skill with dogs and now you've created this yeah. masterpiece that can be delivered either in person and then like I say, if you can do it through content, even uh, not necessarily even better, but it allows you to administer that at scale internationally is is amazing. And it's, um, yeah, you can go very philosophical or psychological with that. It's um, an interesting discussion, but I think it's... Um, yeah at the core of the problem we're talking about is that, um, and they're the ones that get through to me, but then it's important. And that's, again, I have to remind myself of this is 
because then it's easy to be annoyed at that person. But then I have to empathize with myself of that person that's just got through my armor of going, I know where that came from. So I worked with kids like you and I know what their life was that created the child that then yep. became this human that is now the being this nasty. Comment, yeah. And again, you have to empathy. Obviously it goes both ways. Um, and you have to kind of, I think that's the best cure because then you can come back to love and kindness then. And if you remember that, um, yeah, that's that's just a, a sad person that's probably been through a lot of bad things that has created this lack of empathy and high levels of narcissism that's now mm. this thing that we're mm -hmm. unfortunately the yeah the, the victim of. I don't know if victim's the right word, but yeah. But people see that. So then people that are writing these comments, the aspiring dog trainers, they're seeing that as well. And they're seeing the hate that comes at us. And then they're like, well, if I step out, that's going to come at me as well. And then therefore I won't step out. And that's almost a bigger shame to me of that that stops people who care, who have empathy, who want to help. It stops because it takes one bad apple to ruin the bunch. Yeah, and they haven't really developed their skin yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And nor do they want to because they're not prepared to fight Yeah, mm -hmm. that war, that mental war that you and I probably fight every day. And it's gotten, you know, better. But it's, uh, yeah, it's tough. Like, even, like, it's it's as I mature and get older, especially now having a, a kid, mm -hmm. it's gotten way worse. Isn't it funny how much that, and the people tell you that, don't they, before you have kids? Yeah. And you're like, all right. Yeah. And you're, and you're like, okay, no, they were right. It does... 100%. Yeah. Like when we were in the city, it, it was like I couldn't stop. That's why I recognize so many like famous people or whatever because I'm constantly looking mm -hmm. for things. And there were two equations or two situations that when we were in the city that I just like – there was uh, so when we were at Rockefeller Center, when you I couldn't go up to the top of the rock because I had a knife on me. <laughs> And I wasn't willing to give it up, you know, because I've that had it. to UK listeners will sound so sketchy. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, but, very not common to carry knives in England. Yeah, so pretty much everybody, you know, walks around with just a small little pocket knife that I, I actually use it mainly to open up all my wife's Amazon boxes <laughs> that come through. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, so I was just down at the Today Show where they were filming and I just was kind of looking up at these buildings and I'm just kind of reminiscing of like, what great times I've had at this Rockefeller Center filming the Today Show three times now and just kind of looking up and being like, I wonder what I want to do when I grow up. You know, just having this like, this has been a wild ride. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and even like when we went into um, uh, uh, G. Willikers, or what, what's that toy store that we went to? F.A. Schwartz. Mm -hmm. We went into F.A. Schwartz and, and I was telling you guys like the first Today Show I was like, this is an awesome opportunity. My wife was pregnant with Banks at the time, and we got him a bear, and we got him this thing, and we're just going to make this thing. And when he grows up, we'll be like, Daddy was on the Today Show talking about dogs. Mm -hmm. And then it happened again, and then it happened again, and then it happened again. And, and it was like this whole thing where it was just like, what is, what is this going to be, and what do I really want to be when I grow up? Because, and, and so anyway, so I was out there, and this woman – was sitting on the curb and I can just hear her like weeping, like crying. And she was by herself. And I kind of just glanced over and you could just tell she was obviously upset. And there was just part of me where I was like, I want to go like ask if she wants a hug or needs a hug or if she's okay. But then there's this other part of me is like, I also don't want to be the, her thinking like, get out of here, weirdo. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I just sat there and dealt with it. Like my part of my brain was like, she's like, I went, to my, I hear my dad's voice. Like, are you okay? Mm. Do you need anything? Is it, can I call somebody? And then the other part of me was like, she's going to kick me in my, you know what? And like, <laughs> I don't know. And then there was this other time too, where we, when you guys got an Uber back to the hotel and I was, Taylor and I were just leaving like where the plaza is there. And there was this ambulance, and there was these two young girls sitting outside of the ambulance. They were probably like 12 to 14, tall, tall younger girls, just kind of like, they were sisters. They looked, and they were just kind of like sitting there, kind of holding arms, looking into the ambulance, just like devastated, like lip 
quivering, like tears rolling. And I just was like, I, I just am like, I got to do, so- I have to do something like it, nobody else is doing some thousands of people are walking by. Can I do something? And I'm, as I'm walking by, I just kind of look into the ambulance cause that's who I am. I'm kind of nosy like that. And I just see like this probably 45, 50 year old man. I'm like, that's their dad. And then I immediately was like, imagine going out in a in, in, in a glorious time with your family shopping and dad falls for a heart attack or dad does this or whatever and now you're here and all of these emotions are like yeah. rotating through my head and I'm like can I do something should I do something is it inappropriate I don't, so, so we live in this world where having these natural inklings to reach out to hug or hold somebody's hand if they need help I'm like I don't but I also want to get canceled mm. And it's weird that we live in that world, but, and Taylor's like kind of talking to me and, and I kind of snap like a movie. I'm like, wait, what, what did, and she's like, what do you do? I'm like, I just, it, so as I've gotten older, that empathy and that, that like emotion, I dump into other people to see these pictures of what I think could have happened mm-hmm. and how that makes me feel is getting a lot more because then you, when you watch a movie and having kids now, the movie scenes with kids, losing their parents or whatever. It's like you, I feel it so much more. And so anyway, kind of off topic, but the only thing that really gets through my armor these days, and I don't know how you handle this as a dog trainer, professional business owner. And it's, I I don't know how to handle it, but it's when we get those comments or DMS that are like what you said, where it's like, Hey, if you don't respond, my dog's going to be put down. And there's this like fury that comes, I've never had fury like this. Like, you're a shitty dog trainer because you use a prong collar. I'm like, okay. (laughs) You know, the e-collars are banned in my country, you abusive piece of it. And I'm like, okay. Like, that doesn't bother me. But when somebody tells me and gives me this opposition of like, if you don't respond to my need right now, my dog's going to die. And I'm like, that is the most selfish thing you can do to somebody like myself because I'm like, and that's that's one thing that like kind of is this chimney fire of like it just overloads me and i want to like there's the immediate part of like maybe my ego that's like i i have a full-time assistant that does my schedule you really think i can just jump at this mm-hmm. and then also a little bit more of my ego that's like i have a hundred and two hundred plus free videos on probably what you're dealing with mm-hmm. and I have to run a business and I don't just, I can't just drop every, you know, and all of these emotions come through. And that's like the only thing nowadays that can really ups. And even now I'm like frustrated Mm -hmm. because I can see these comments and these DMS and then people will send you the, the pictures of the dog and and I, and and, and I'm a human. Mm -hmm. I'd love to sit here and say to people and you'd be like, I never check my DMS. Of course I do. And I have, and that's the only thing that really upsets me is like, cause they, I can't do anything. My, my hands are literally tied. The amount of logistics and effort that it would take to get a hold of this person, to try to get them to my schedule and work with them for, or the other one is, is like, my dog is going to be put down. I don't have money for training. If you don't help, this is going to happen. And then, then I'm like, really like, okay. So I have to leave. So you're expecting me to leave three or four days from my facility, which is money on the table that is going to go to my mortgage and my son's this and, you know, my car payments and whatever to go and help you because you don't have the, that is something I have a really hard time with. I think it makes sense because it's this, it's a hyper equation of you being a hyper empathetic person and you're empathizing with the dog, I imagine, in those situations, 100%. which is where it hits me because I, I almost get frustrated with the person, but I'm empathizing yeah. with the dog. It's always the dog that suffers Yeah. from a person. So you're hyper empathizing with them or at least their dog with somebody that has is coming at you with zero empathy for you. And the, the, the scales are then tipped way out and it's, um, it's, it's frustrating. Um, does, that, does that get to you? I mean, does that... Yeah. 100%. And it's because... And the, the reason I get frustrated is because it's the dog that suffers. And that's the thing that um, that frustrates me. And the, uh, and the level of entitlement that they often come with, with the, like, you say, it's demanding almost. And 
with also no like i've got more kind of time for the people that will i have messed up massively here i've made so many, this is all my fault but i don't know where else to go and i found you and i just need help can you help me please like that person i've i've got time for but when it's that like oh, you've just put this burden of a dog dying on me like that's now on me and my emotions and that's um chokes me up there that's mm -hmm. It's not a nice thing to do to somebody. And, mm -hmm. and it's... Um, it's kind of like going to a restaurant and saying, like, I'm starving, you need to feed yeah, my yeah, family. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I have a business to run here. Yeah, and it's, um, it's difficult. My, genuinely, it, it bothers me just as much. Um, th the only way I've been able to manage it is to not look. I, I don't have an answer to that question, um, or at least a one other than don't look. So now I, I, and hand, I haven't looked at DMs or comments in, it's got to be well over 12 months now. It's into the years, and I've got people that do it, and there's and we, we just have categories now, and, and there's systems where it'll funnel to me, but it, it goes through a flow to allow that to happen. Um, yeah, it's just I'm yeah, sitting well, there, like, you know, there's just times where I'm kind of, I just find myself, like, kind of, you know, maybe anxious, mm. at, you know, doing something, and then I'll, like, just pop open Instagram, hit my DMs really quick to see, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And then I see this like thing, like and I've got I've got a really addictive personality with stuff, so like I I just can't have social media on my phone anymore because I would do if it's on there, I would do it before I I didn't even consciously aware that I would do it, and then I'd catch up while I'm on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. I'd close it. Who opened this? And then within seconds, it's back open. And I don't know. So yeah. my thing, I've just, I've just, like an addict, I've got a cold turkey, this. I've just. Yeah, that's it's good. Um, th there's been negative downsides to that because now I'm not in the loop with certain things. I miss out on like seeing posts from people I genuinely care about and would like to follow. But it's just been a, a thing that I've had to implement to, to kind of help make this sustainable and to remain enjoyable. I don't feel guilty yeah. about me wanting to enjoy what I do either. And that was just chipping away at my enjoyment of creation. Yep. Um, That's what I'm, I'm almost to that point. Like mm -hmm. I have a team that handles almost like everything except my personal Instagram. Mm -hmm. And um, we're setting up where she can do that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just done with all of it because it, it takes it, it's a con, it's 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 a creative killer. Yeah. Because for that reason that I was talking about before, where you know Abby and I will go to go do something, and it's like this beautiful creation, and there'll just be one person that's like that's, um, you know, and there it's just it's it's just part of being a human. I, I'd love to sit here and say like any other excuse, but when you put so much heart, yeah, and care for the general good of oh you know that person that just paid me five thousand dollars to train their dog i'm gonna give it to millions of people for free because i mm. care and yeah. then there's a person that's like this isn't how you train at all but that that's not to blow smoke that's why i like you uh, going back to that first story of when we met because it's funny i saw the poster there i've not seen that for ages it's mm -hmm. proud like sponsor thanks to the sponsor fenrir at the bottom yeah, i didn't realize and i that. remember you DM in, say, do you want to, you've got this opportunity to sponsor it. And I talked to my team and, oh, maybe we could do like gift bags on every chair and, or we could have a little stall or something. And I was like, no, I want to pay it. I don't know if I've told you this story. So I'm like, I feel like I'd really get on with Tom. I'm going to pay this money. And excuse me, I was like, but this literally, I'm going to see if he's a dickhead. That's genuinely what I was like. I'll pay the money. I'll go, I'll hang out. Um, I'll see if it's all an act or not. And that was genuinely right or wrong. But at the time, I was, I'm curious. Um, fast forward a few years, I consider you a close friend. That's from, though, that realisation of that that's where that comes from. Because mm. if that didn't bother you, it would show that the... And again, I don't discredit people. If your foundational principle is to make loads of money, you do you. Cool, crack on. I've got no ill will towards that whatsoever. Um not the kind of person that I would just choose to kind of have as a close friend or in my inner circle. But for someone like you, it's just, it highlights, I would be more concerned if it didn't bother you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and as much as that's a, a bad thing to say, uh, not a bad thing to say, it's um, it's not nice. Obviously it bothers you, but I'm sitting there and I'm like, it's kind of cool though. Cause it yeah. shows you're a good person and that you care. Cause if, 
otherwise it wouldn't bother you and it wouldn't be an issue and, yeah. and it's that dual edged sword thing isn't it of social media and yeah I'd want us to get onto is there any other good questions because yeah, we yeah. have that like oh woe is you two Mr. all these followers and stuff and moaning about how bad it is because <laughs> again the, uh, I think I like having these conversations because I I like to be real with people and let people behind the curtain because I find that fascinating and there's lots Same. of creators that I've watched their podcast and I'm like that meant so, and I'll never be able to tell that person, but that meant so much to me of me. Oh, it's not just me. Yeah. Like it, it was super useful. So I, I always like to do that, but I don't want to um, make it seem like this whole thing is all bad as well. Cause yeah, I, it's, there's a lot of beautiful things to it. And I would encourage people that if they're interested in doing it, it's, it's a, yes, there are these things that you have to consider and there'll be bumps that you'll come across as well. And hopefully by us having this conversation, you'll be like, oh, cool. It isn't just me. And those guys go through it as well. And <clears throat> well, I think a it... lot of beautiful things about it as well. Like the fact that I'm sat here, the fact that we were hanging out in New York and stuff, like I say, it all came from, from YouTube and I've made good friends from it and it's provided a great life for me and my family and and the, and the other thing as well and this is something I don't know if you've ever thought about this and it surprises me in every other niche it seems on YouTube people in the same niche or niche for you Americans will I say niche do you say niche yeah classy guy um <laughs> they will there's this widely accepted truth that kind of rising tides lift all ships and they want to collab and help each other and support each other and mm -hmm. that's something i've noticed in the dog industry there's this still this um belief that it's like i'm taking food off your plate or you're taking food off my plate and it's all competition and for me i've, I've just never seen it that way and i've always kind of wanted to encourage people to like do it yeah and follow us copy thumbnails and titles and styles and stuff like let's go the more the better because it helps that mission and um well i think yeah and i think two things is it's easy to see the beautiful good stuff we don't have to explain what's good about our career mm. people are watching that yeah. they see that mm -hmm. they see the things that we get to do and the places we get to go and the people we get to meet that's an easy thing for people to go that's pretty cool mm. you know but some of the things that they don't get to ever see and how we deal with it is what we're talking about now, yeah. which yeah, is, right. which is why I think it's important that mm -hmm. like, you know, I'll be honest, like those, those types of things, like they just bother me so much. And I'm just, but I think that, you know, and I've said, and, and people who've been following me and listening to me or air quotes, fans of me or my message or what I've done, I genuinely, and that's why I wanted to do this person podcast because I got to know some of people that I was like, like you said, like, and I remember Ju uh, Julia, one of our staff, she's, she tells this story so funny. I would go get her in here, but she would start screaming in the mic and yelling and hack cackling and laughing and it would mess up the levels anyway. But she tells this story of um, when she, she, she basically like uh, didn't, did an out of state and like shadowed a little bit. And then I remember her telling me, and she always tells this story, so I don't mind telling it for her, but she said something along the lines of like, I was so terrified to meet you because I looked up to you and I respected you and I was absolutely terrified and I would have been absolutely devastated if you weren't who I thought you were. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense because I've met people too or recently people like, the you know, and, and like I was saying, the fringe benefits of like going into you know, different green rooms and being with like everybody from whatever, like all walks of life. And you kind of like cross paths with these people. Even this weekend we cross paths with some, some heavy hitters and people that we would be like, wow, they're like really crushing it on the social game. And they're, you know, and, and I got the chance to talk to these people or one of these people. And it's like, I'm glad that they're cool. Mm -hmm. Cause I genuinely like look up to them or inspire or have some sort of inspiration behind these people. And, and, and same thing in like, you know, the, the dog training space, there's just some people that I'm like, man, like, I don't care how you train. I don't care what you preach. I don't care if you don't like me. I'm inspiring. I'm inspired by you to some degree because of what you've done, because you know, it's hard to be a creator mm -hmm. and we can push all the like, do we agree or not? That doesn't matter as much as like, I think respect is always this big mm -hmm. thing. And, um, you'll just find that so much in the dog training space where everyone's trying to be right. And everyone's like, can we all agree? Like th they're right. Right. Or they're right. And it's like, that's never going to happen guys. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, go. Anyway, I got some questions. Um, <clears throat> one question that comes from I X hang, which is trends come and go in the dog training industry. What trend bothers you the most right now? 
It's a good question, isn't it? Good question. I can go first if you want. I've got a couple of ideas if you've got one ready. There's just one that um, makes me uncomfortable. I mentioned it last podcast too. Is, you know when like a movie comes out, like Dog came out with Channing Tatum, I don't know if that was over the UK, or Mm -hmm. these movies that come out that really highlight this dog breed. In that case, it was the Malinois. The question is, what bothers you? This doesn't bother me that much. This just kind of makes me a little frustrated a little bit. Is the education on the classifications of different types of dog training. So what a lot of people don't understand is there's competitive dog trainers out there that will do circles around you and I and our dogs because that's not really what we do and they're better. But you and I are lifestyle dog trainers helping as many dog owners as we can keep their dog out of the shelter and off the youth table. But what is frustrating for me sometimes is seeing people work with these competitive dogs and putting the content out because that's what they do. And then dog owners, like watching a movie, are going to say, like, I want my dog to be that cool. I'm going to go get a Dutch Shepherd puppy. Or, and it doesn't have to be with competitive obedience because what they're doing is, is great and amazing and really cool and impressive. But what happens is, is you and I are going to get those dogs. Those competitive dog trainers are not going to get those dogs. We are because yeah. they're going to get that dog that looks really fancy and cool. And, you know, dog owners are doing this. And they're going through TikTok and they're going through Instagram Reels and they're going through YouTube Shorts and they're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and then and it's this really flashy video of these dogs doing some really impressively cool shit. And I'm not trying to decredit any of the... Because tra- it's something I've never done. I'm, I, and um, But what I'm seeing is is sometimes I'll just look at some of the comments and people are like, what kind of dog is that? Where'd you get that dog? And I'm like... That scares me a little bit. So it doesn't bother me. I guess maybe my definition, it bothers me, but it more concerns me than anything. That's what I'm seeing. And then same thing on the other end of the spectrum of people breeding um, really big dogs, like the Borbles, the Corsos, things like that, and posting these videos of these, same thing, posting these videos of these dogs like being impressive. And then again, like, who are you putting that content out for? Because... In my opinion, and this is what you and I do, so it's not wrong, right, or indifferent, we're putting things out there to gain more attention towards our brand to help people or to get discovered by potential clients or all three. But when you're putting these videos out, the only thing that's going to end up happening for those types of people is because they don't have the foundation to like, uh, well, some of them do, but it's just people are just going to want those dogs and then you and I are going to get them that was exactly going to be the thing that I was going to say. Uh, what the trend is, um, especially in the UK, is... It's Can I stop you right there for one second? I'm so sorry to interrupt. But one thing I would just say, when you said trend, I don't think dog dogs are a trend. Mm-hmm. I just, that popped in my head. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, wait a minute. I don't think dogs are trends at all. And I think we're living in a world where everything is trendy. Yeah. Go on. I think within the, I think there, there are trends within the dog niche. I suppose what would you define a trend? Sure. Um, rise and falls in popularity of breeds. If you define that as a trend or not a trend, but that would be, if he's asking kind of what trends do I see, that's um, it's exactly the same, and that's what I'm seeing with. Um, a lot of people in the sporting world that get upset with me um, because when I've been interviewed by the big newspapers in the UK and stuff, um, I've talked about this problem and that it is, fortunately, um, Malinois are the thing at the minute uh, that it's happening to. Um, and lots of people are getting them that are, and this is where for me, I'm like, because the, the, the trainers in which they're observing, and that's what like, they're amazing. Exactly. The Malinois are amazing. Yeah. The trainers that get them there are amazing. What they can they can do is amazing. The content is amazing. I consume that content if I ever watch it and think that that's amazing. 
I have this wealth of experience though that makes me think, but that would not fit well with my lifestyle. So I yeah. don't have one. A lot of people either have that understanding but do it anyway or don't have that understanding and then get it. But you're right, they're then coming to us six, nine, 12 months down the line, um, an absolute neurotic mess because uh, then they're being bred badly because the popularity or trend is increasing. So then bad breeders jump onto that rise of popularity. So then really bad breeding practices come in, which makes the problems worse. And yeah, that that's the thing that, again, is bother me, the um, right answer. It's an issue that I'm seeing yeah. a lot at the minute. Mm. So it's similar to what yeah, I was yeah. saying. It's like, and I, and I'm trying to play devil's advocate here because I'm sure that we can spin that towards us too. Is like maybe some of the things that we do with dogs isn't necessarily something that a pet owner should go out and do, yeah. right? Like introducing a certain tool or working with a certain dog a certain way. And and I've even thought about. Have you ever thought about this? I've even thought about because I get that it's the same thing that maybe um, anybody could bounce onto us. We're like, well, I could say the same thing about you, Tom, because because the thing that I think. One of the mis one of the most misunderstood things about I think my personal career, one of them, is that I'm the tool guy. Mm -hmm. So people are like, "That's the prong collar, e collar guy." And I even had this person, and I remember like I was on a friend's page, and uh, they had posted like this video that I, they were just like, "Yeah, that's crack on." But I I'm adopting crack on if if that's okay. Yeah, that no problem. It's all yours. Cool. I'll adopt do it up okay yeah do it up we, we went over <laughs> oh it's so <laughs> side note uh will had asked me like do you want to go uh, w i'm thinking about going down for a nap or something is that okay you know are we willing to do that or is it are we going to leave soon and i said yeah just do it up and then he texted me and he's like i was like yeah do it up and he's like um what does that mean <laughs> you, you didn't put the yeah and that would have made more oh, okay. sense it was just do it up uh, do it I've up got, i was like i have no idea like you could be mocking me right now or you could be like, like yeah go ahead and do it um so i was like rather than guessing i've just got to ask you i've got yeah. no idea mm. yeah and then i've adopted like crack on which basically means just like go on with it and, and like continue like yeah just yeah, anyway similar so we crack on and do it up yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly well, so anyway crack on what you were saying yeah exactly <laughs> boom it's like uh, when I go to the UK, I overly use cheeky to make everyone laugh. It's like my, it always makes people laugh. But anyway, so yes, yeah, so I just said this one person, she's like, I really want to like Tom, but he, he, his first thing is always tools. And I think one misconception, not that anyone asked, but I just would say that I work with a certain group of people and a certain group of dogs almost consistently. Mm -hmm. I have the outliers. But mainly it's a person that has already tried two or three other trainers and they have a dog that they cannot physically control, typically, and they cannot control mentally at all. They're off the hinges going bananas, stressing themselves out to un, un, uh, unethical points in their life. And so when a dog comes in, the reason why usually these, these dogs are already been introduced by equipment and all these things and so it's one thing that's just interesting i'll just throw in i don't know where this came from but i i don't know how i got on this but it's one thing that just people don't understand i think is when i am working with a dog it's it's not it's not like i and i think that that's the dog training like whole left and right positive only versus whatever that's what i think it comes down to is when you're looking at a dog that's like a cute little puppy and a dog with no behavioral issues and then you're like well, why would you go in and slap an e-collar and a prong collar on that dog? That's I'm like, I wouldn't. It's not what I would do. I wouldn't never do that. If you look at like some of my foundational videos, it's a leash, a flat collar, and treats, and that's it. But I that that's what like sometimes I see is people put me into this category of like he's gonna put a piece of equipment on every dog. But I, I, I urge people to understand and be educated that the dogs that I come in are traveling 13, 14, 15 miles, or I'm sorry, hours to get to me. The dogs come in stressed, um, and again, they're all out of sorts and control, and typically they're large dogs that are dangerous and less controlled, and so we start off with these tools for that reason and something that, I don't know how I got down that road. I got another question. Okay, this comes from Cynthia XO 11 Are boarding trains necessary for reactive dogs, or will private training work? Good question. I, I think both are great. Mm -hmm. I, I think the only... Um, 
I think with a reactive dog, I guess we'd have to define that first for the audience. Is like, for me, reactivity is when something enters the environment and the dog reacts to it. And it doesn't matter if it's a reaction on, hey, I'm excited to see you and I'm wiggling my butt and I'm dragging the owner down the road. Or it's, I don't like you and I'm barking at you to get you out of here. I'm scared that you're here. That's a reaction to me is like when you have this, like if this was filled with, this is my, this is going to be a nice little short that we're going to do, right, Abby? Okay, ready? If I put Coca-Cola in this cup, my definition of dog reactivity is simply taking a Mentos. This is an environment and this is an environment. Pepsi, Mentos, separately. That's all they are, is dog and then person. And then when you combine them, we get a reaction. So that's my definition of reactivity. When something enters an environment that makes the dog react on both ends of the spectrum of excited that you're here, or I'm really not excited that you're here. And so if you spend enough time with that person privately, it's successful. But what I find board and trains to be more successful at, perfect example, I went to the chiropractor today, as you know, And he was basically saying that because of my early on stages of getting dragged around by dogs as a dog walker in my early 20s, I have like a bad lower back. And he was saying that basically your body um, goes into this like uh, routine. I don't know the right word for it, but it stays into this rhythm, right? And it stays into this thing and it takes months for it to break its cycle. Like you have to retrain your dog or your your body to basically not act a certain way and not move a certain way orthopedically. And so he was saying like, even if we help with the pain that you're dealing or the discomfort that you're dealing with, your body is still going to muscle memory go back into this position to slide you back into that place. Mm -hmm. So I find that when you get a dog that is really reactive and you have an owner that isn't capable of physically handling or just mentally handling because they have two or three jobs and six kids and they're just they can't do it but they love the dog that's where the board and train is more beneficial is allowing that dog to plug in with a professional to get that muscle memory out Mm. so they can think but reactivity for privates is just as as long as the owner gets it and it's only reactivity and it's not true aggression you should be fine right yeah absolutely yeah, board and trains is something I haven't done. It's something I would like to do um, at some point. I just don't have the kind of facility available to be able to do it. Um, but it's something that, it, that board and trains are definitely much more common here. That, that's an yeah. interesting thing. It's it's something that's um, very new in the UK to be a... It's definitely getting more and more popular. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um we kind of already answered this. This is from Dawn underscore Krista. She says, what is the most frustrating aspect of your jobs and career? And I think we've already cracked on yeah. about that. A waffle Fest covered that, I think. Yeah. Um, this is a great question. RB Canine Academy. What is your best answer to clients who have issues with your prices as a dog trainer? Oh, this might make me sound like a dick. Um, I rarely get it. Um, very open about my prices um, and I think people are so I don't hear from them if they have a problem with them because they just don't contact so by the act of people kind of contact contacting it they know what they're getting in for um, and th- this is one of the benefits of of growing large social media followings is that your demand starts to massively outweigh the supply that you're available to mm-hmm. offer. So even if people have a problem with it from a business perspective, it's um, it's less of an issue because um, there's other people there that are willing to deal with it. Um, yeah, it's. I'm interested in your answer on that because it's again it's one of those things that it's a I think that's a a fortunate position to be in. Yeah. Uh yeah, I would agree. I'm going to give context to this person because there was a point in my career where I would be doing consult after consult after consult before I was to a point where I don't do consults anymore. I have a team that does it. Uh and so if I was at a point where somebody had come into my facility and they've already maybe reached out to a couple other training facilities in the area and they come in and they, they say something along the lines of like, why is your prices like that? Or, you know, that seems awfully expensive for dog training. I, 
I, I think I've done a pretty good job at making things digestible for people. Mm. It's not just like, well, you get what you pay for. Mm. It's more about just saying you have a dog. And typically we, we – so it does, it does help by making a name for yourself and having a reputation for sure because two things is if that person doesn't sign up, the next person will. That's not always everyone's reality though. Um, but you really have to just be, but here's where ego comes in. Cause I used to have a hard time with this because for that reason people, so, and this is, and again, I'm being honest, this is a natural thing, um, as a human being and as a, at the, you know, a young man, I guess it's like when I had somebody traveling from a really far way or somebody would fly me out somewhere to train their dog. And then I had somebody locally who had no idea who I was. And they're like, those are little steep prices. I had to stop my ego from being like, what? And I was like, again, maybe empathy and, and just professionalism of just saying like, oh, yeah, okay, this, this, how do I pitch myself to this person? And it kind of is fun. Yeah. Because they don't know, they don't know you from Bill or f from anybody. And that's like, that's a reality. And that's, that's, there's a, you know, I think in the dog training industry, and I've talked about this before, is it's really easy to let your ego take over your life because we are in an industry where everyone is like, for the most part, telling you how much you've changed their life and how, you know, and any any dog trainer out there can understand where I'm coming from, where you get a dog that comes in and we just do a quick tune-up and the owner's picking their jaw up off the floor and that's our everyday life. Yeah. And it's really easy to let things, you got to keep it in check. And I've been doing a lot of research over the years on ego and keeping that in check and making sure that I'm understanding that, you know, I'm, I'm not the best and I'm not... Um, People don't care how good you are. They still like work hard for their money, and they want to know like why are you this month much money? And so I think that the an my answer would be just explaining to people that your job is to make their beloved pet fit better into their life, and it's something that you don't take lightly, and it's something that you're going to work really hard on. And um, there's also just people, and we deal with it all the time, and we've had we have some really good systems at filtering out these types of people anyway. But there's just people who are just assholes. Mm -hmm. They come in and they're like, they're the type of people that orders the zucchini chips, eats all of them, and then calls the waitress over and says, these were terrible. I, I want a refund. Mm -hmm. There's people out there that are like that. And so there's that. But I think if people have a hard time with your prices, um, you have to also be able to back it up. So if anybody in your industry is, you know, say, um, say there's three other training companies in your area and they are all, let's say, a hundred dollars a session and you are 250 you have to be able to have some sort of pitch to them of why you're that mm -hmm. and um it, it's and it's not and again it's like you know some people will be well because i'm just better than them or i'm good or i get better results you can't do that because they don't know that and you don't even know that mm -hmm. so i think it's just like understanding your value and why are you different well so for me it would be Let's say that I'm giving Will a consultation right now, and he just asked me why I'm 250 instead of 100. I would say something along the lines of like, well, you know, one thing that we are different at as a company is we really specialize in relationship changing, and we are lifestyle dog trainers. So oftentimes people don't understand the difference between maybe an obedience trainer down the road or somebody over here that's going to help your dog be socialized as a puppy or maybe the PetSmart course over here that's going to work on clinical uh, development in a very unrealistic space or something like that. What we're going to do is we're going to put you into a lot of different scenarios to set you up for success in the future. And we're going to make sure that we're going to be answering all the questions that you have. And we're going to make sure that when you leave here, you don't have any questions and that we're going to be able to support you for the lifetime of your dog. I don't want to, I only want to see you for your first package, but I want to hear from you often to let me know how things are going. And not only that, but we have a ton of curriculum that we're going to send you home with. And so just being able to tell people like what, what makes you different and what, what services can you offer? And for me, that's what it was is like, I'm not an obedience trainer. I'm not, uh, anything other than if you have a problem with your dog or you want your relationship to be better with your dog, I will help you understand your dog better. And within return of that, you're going to get rid of the behavioral problems or at least know where they have come from. Mm -hmm. And so we really focus on building a better relationship between you and your dog. 
So the majority, and the other thing is, is telling people, giving them the expectations to say like, the majority of work that we're going to do in this company is going to be on your end. Because if I'm a good fitness trainer and you come in and you want to lose 50 pounds, I'm not going to do the work for you. I can't. And if you're going to go home with your dog, you have to know what you're doing. So we're going to treat you like a, like a beginner dog trainer. And by the time you leave our program, we want you to be confident enough to not only train your dog, but to be able to train your neighbor's dog. We're going to give you that much information. And that's really how I would pitch myself. And that's Sign how we, up. I'll yeah, pay that $250. Yeah. I just, I just think like, but again, like some people don't, they're not like that. They don't have that. And so, so maybe you need to lower your prices. If people are questioning you about your prices and you're higher than people around and then they're like, why are you this much? And you don't know what, you don't know why you're this much. I think that there's also a fair play there. Yeah. Mm. So, Okay. Um, that's a good question though. So when are you coming to Asia? I don't think we have anything in the plans for that. Uh, somebody says, I love you guys. I want to hear everything. Um, another question came, this is something I think we answered pretty well is bear basics canine Academy. Hello, fellow dog trainer here. How do you tackle online hate? I think we've gone over that pretty good. Um, Oh, one question I was going to ask you that I've never heard of this person asked, um, hold on, let me find it really quick. I've never heard of what she or he had said thoughts uh, this is from shayla d miller thoughts on model rival theory love you both i've never even heard of that model rival theories quite um it was researched in birds um and people are starting to adopt it in kind of advanced behavior when i started my phd um it was it was involved in that um, and model rival theory is around kind of the layman's terms is having one dog observe another dog. I I would boil it down to kind of how I would util- you would utilize kind of role model dogs, but it's um, setting up one dog to observe another dog, usually gaining access to a reward, um, and then and creating that rivalry and then they will model the behaviors that they observed gained the other dog access to a reward um a lot of gun dog trainers will do this without realizing that it's this fancy behavior term that they'll tether up a young labrador and just watch an older labrador retrieve and then eventually you bring the young labrador out and all it wants to do is go and chase that thing so it's just observed um, the other dog yeah it's one of the things you can go deep into the kind of psychology of it but it's um yeah, that's the the summary of it. I use it a lot, um, so I use Uncle Sully for a lot. Um, but again, it's like many things. It's just people like to put fancy <laughs> yeah. terminologies so on it. It's essentially watching another dog do something that gets them rewarded in hopes of the dog watching will then replicate that. Yeah, and there's been tests around doing it um, with with punishment as well. I don't know if you 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 saw the clip. Um, it, it did the rounds where there's. Um, I don't watch many clips. Even my staff are like, did you see this? I'm like, I don't want to see it. It was a few years ago, actually, but I think it was a pit bull, and the guy's got like a dinosaur model on his hand, and he smacks the dinosaur model like he's... Uh, the dog The dog does something. He goes for a ball, um, and so the dog, the pit bull gets the ball, and then the owner takes the ball off the, out of the pit bull's mouth. Immediately, he puts it into this like little hand puppet of a, um, like, it's like a dinosaur thing, and he starts smacking the hand puppet really hard on top of the head. The dog. Immediately takes, just whether it's the same person or a different person does it, and the pit bull's watching this dinosaur get smacked on the head for taking the ball he then takes the ball out and offers it to the pit bull and the pit bull just immediately turns its mouth Mm. from like a second ago wanting the ball in its mouth took it out offered it to this dinosaur the dinosaur got punished for it then they took it out of the dinosaur's mouth and offered it back to the pit bull and the pit bull turned its head and didn't want it that would be um another potential um like I say, the studies that I read were in birds and it was birds uh, and it was reward based. But like I discuss why I kind of left that PhD is because the um, the ethics of those studies can only ever be reward based stuff anyway. So then th- that would just be a it was a silly kind of YouTube video example. But I was like, oh, that that would be an interesting example of model rival theory from more of a um, punishment perspective. Yeah. 
But it's hard to say, right? Like, it's hard to say, you know, maybe the pit bull was like, why is this guy aggressive? Yeah. Like, I don't want to play anymore. Exactly. And yeah. then that theory goes out the window. And that's yeah, the yeah. problem with science, right? Is it, 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 it defines for sure that like now the pit bull doesn't want it. Yeah. But it forgets about all the nuances. Yeah, the energy that was involved, the noise that was involved, was yeah. it reacting more to the, the, the sounds yeah. involved? Yeah. That's why I read between the lines on, on almost all that stuff is like, you can you can get like you can squeeze out science to say like yeah this could be that mm -hmm. but then you know as as somebody who is boots on the ground working with these dogs every single day and seeing great phenomenal sustainable international success i'm also like honest with myself to say yeah but even bringing that energy to the table where the dog is playing with a ball yeah. And then they're like, oh, this is a cool ball. And then we take it out of the dog's mouth. We give it to a fake dinosaur head. And then we start smacking the dinosaur head. I know for a fact that my dog's behavior will change. Even if I yell at the the football game on the TV and she's like, I'm different. I'm leaving. Yeah. So you, you bring this kind of aggressive, um, violent. And then the dog's like, I don't really want to play anymore. Yeah. But then they'll say like, that's, that's that. And, you're, and, and for me, I'm like, no, that's not that. That's yeah. not that at all. Mm -hmm. But you can. It, it would. It would technically be like a. Here's science, and it's like, well, okay, all right. Um, for a uh, favorite treat to keep in your treat pouch when working with a dog you don't know, what's like your go-to? Like, this is what I'm gonna use. It's a good question. I I always prefer if the dog's fed dry food. I I like to use that as much as possible. Um. What is it? Just kibble or just kibble? Yeah. yeah, yeah, wherever possible. Um, and then I'll I'll often mix up. Just kind of I'll have low value and high value. Um, the low value I always try and use as much kibble as possible. So if a dog comes to me, I'll tell the owner if it f is fed two meals a day, uh, don't feed it breakfast. Just give me that breakfast, and that's in my treat pouch, and that's mm -hmm. usually my go-to. Um, and then I'll sprinkle in cocktail sausages, or um, I've tried to get. Um, that freeze dried beef liver loads of times. It's a nightmare to try mm. and get in the UK. Um, yeah, so I am um, with it and it looked great. And for me, high value stuff when it goes to like meats and cheeses and stuff. And I just don't like getting it all over my hands yeah. all the time, which is why that freeze dried stuff seemed like a winner. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, that's what I use. Stewart's pro treats. Um, yeah, they're, it's like just single ingredient. And I always ask, like, is your dog allergic? And they say no. Mm -hmm. And then I'll use that. It's the best because they can work it out. And it's my favorite. And I have i can't remember a dog that was like, yeah, I'm not interested in this. It's like 100% freeze-dried beef liver. Mm -hmm. And they break it apart. Um, Happy Howie's is another one here in the States that we use. But I don't use it. My staff will use it. Uh, okay, we've gone over, like, tips for aspiring trainers. Um, this is an interesting question. I'll, I'll, I have two just spe specifically for you is why doesn't he use e-collars? I do use e-collars. Um, done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boom, boom. Roasted. It's, it's in my toolbox. Um, I don't use them. Like, like I said earlier, I like to do intensive days. It's kind of my, um, the service I offer a lot to, I help, I've trained a lot of trainers, to use e-collars properly and then they now offer board and train programs which i think are much better suited for e-collar training mm -hmm. um yeah yeah uh, so one thing i know that you had a meet up with your online academy students mm -hmm. your other trainers coming from all over this world all over the place mm -hmm. what was what was it like for you? Was that one of the first times you kind of sat down and had like a public meet and greet or sorry, not public meet and greet, but like a get together with your students? Yeah, I've done some private stuff, but I would kind of class that as more of like colleagues or invitational. Already, yeah. And they're already working. Um, that was the first time I'd done something in person with students. Yeah. What was your What was your biggest takeaway as you talked to these trainers from all over the world? What was your biggest like after? Here, let me ask you this question: What was what you said to Rachel after it went down? Because that's really like what my initial thoughts are always like. Whatever I say to my wife is how I really felt, and even like again, like last night when when I brought you guys home and came back, I just was like, I told Taylor, I'm like. And it's so nice to sit down and talk to people that get you more than you get you. Yeah. 
And that was like, that's just like what comes to mind. So what was like something that you met all these different trainers, they asked you all these great questions. Um, they were struggling maybe with some things or maybe they were just wanting to get some guidance. What was one thing that you really walked away with as like, that was interesting or what were, what were some consistent questions from them that you felt like so a couple of things the the genuine thing i said when i got in the truck with rachel straight away was that went really well i'm glad that went really well talking earlier about like um self-doubt and stuff of group i think there was 50 people rach yeah there was a decent amount of people to sit stand up and, uh, and talk to a group of people um so I was nervous about that. That was something that was out of my comfort zone. I'll talk to millions of people through a camera, but 50 people in person, and that gets the heart racing a little bit. Um, so that was genuinely my takeaway was um, how well it went and how much I enjoyed it. That was a big thing personally. In terms of from their perspective, um, the questions that I think were coming up a lot, there's always, always when I do stuff kind of like private, kind of live uh, seminar as uh, lecture, sorry, with my students is, um, as we've discussed always around how do you handle hate? How do you handle bad comments? That that's always um, a question and that was, that was prevalent. Um, how to increase your prices for kind of aspiring people that maybe are just getting going and they want to start building up. Um, that's a common theme. What is um, your suggestion for aspiring dog trainers that want to raise their prices so i have a bit of a system and it's always prefaced like i said earlier because it's always the answer that uh, for me value is everything everything with like and you and i you always must be delivering more value than the exchange of value back to you so and prices are that the exchange of value in that relationship is i'm paying you mm -hmm. so this is the value i'm giving to you and you need to give me value in return i always believe that it's your job to give me more value than the value i've given you so you i you you can't raise your prices until you raise the value that you're delivering if that makes sense so that's how i always preface it and you should not even dream about upping your prices unless that's the case. Mm -hmm. However, if that's the case, my formula is always, it's just nice because people, it removes the emotion from it because emotion, oh, I if I charge more than that person, that person's been doing it longer than me and then maybe they'll say something really nasty about me behind my back. Like, so remove, this removes the emotion. How far ahead in the future do you like to be fully booked for? What gives you the personal like, okay, I'm booked up. Some people have higher tolerance for risk. I'm like, if I'm booked up for a couple of weeks, I'm gravy, I'm happy. Some people are like, no, I want to be booked up for two months mm -hmm. for me to feel before I start taking any kind of risks. So I'm like, answer yourself that question. Cool. Get to that point. And then how much are you comfortable in increasing your prices by in a percentage in one go? Some people will go up to 50%, some people 10 and again, ask yourself that question and you can literally punch that into a spreadsheet. So, okay, I'm, I want to be, I feel comfortable when I've got, when I'm booked out for the next month. Okay, cool. I'm booked out now for the next month and I feel comfortable in raising my prices by 10% at a time. So you do that, you raise your prices, you then run that for that period of time. So if it's a month, you run it for a month. If after a month, you're still fully booked for a month, you increase it by the percentage again and you keep doing that until you get to a point where you're not fully booked. And then that to me is a reflection that you're not providing the value that is deemed of higher than the mm -hmm. money that you're charging. Then you've got two questions. You either come, you either accept that you're gonna be less booked up than the month or you um, bring your prices a little bit down. You go, okay, cool, I found my cap at the current value that I provide in the area that I'm in. That's kind of the cap. So I come down a little bit or you find ways to increase the value that you offer and then that will allow you to continue to increase your prices. And then the, the way, because then again, that invokes emotion from trainers, especially in England, who have like tall poppy syndrome really bad over there. Um, but for me, I'm like, because cool, then you're just letting the market decide. Like, you, I'm talking to you as someone being me asking that question. I'm like, y you, it's not down to you. It doesn't matter what you think. It's down to them. And you're letting the market decide where that cap is. And if you're staying fully booked, then the market has decided that the value, the money that you're charging is a fair exchange of value. And that's kind of the formula that, that I teach. Um, 
and it's helped people go from they've been fully booked but barely making 15 grand a year to scaling beyond six figures and it just took that confidence to be able to trust in the value because they were providing the value we Mm -hmm. delved into it and i'm like you're a very very talented trainer you are providing value way above and beyond what it is that you're charging for um and they followed that process and they they'll come to the next consultation with me how did it go and they'll tell me i'm like you know what you got to do again and you're doing i know i feel nervous and then they do it and a month later how did it go i'm still fully booked and and then they find sometimes weird things happen. They actually then get more demand. And um, that's been a, an interesting phenomena of the, and I think people's then perceived value is higher because you're charging higher prices. And if you're in that kind of race to the bottom of I need to be cheaper than everyone else, what a lot of consumers or customers will think is that therefore you're worse than everybody else. So I'm not interested in going with you. Yep. And when you start to kind of creep up the prices, they're, natural perception is that you then must be better so therefore i will go with you i'm interested in you more than these other people that must be worse than you obviously your job is to then prove that that's the case and provide that value if you don't you'll go out of business if you do you'll continue to grow and scale Mm -hmm. you let the market decide and and they remove some emotion from it then which i think is good for dog trainers which they're an emotional bunch. So anything you can do to remove that emotion, I think helps, especially new and young people that haven't run businesses before as well. So it's um, overwhelming. Yeah, and I think it's a, sometimes it just, it, like for us, it was a natural evolution. Mm. Like I started for $20 an hour per session. Mm-hmm. So that was like $20 per session. And and, I, and even at that point, I was you know talking to my dad. I'm like, I don't know. Mm. It's kind of crazy, isn't it, Dad? I'm like, $20 an hour? I don't know. And, it, you know, now it's, we have, I think, altogether close to 20 employees. And there's so much that goes in, you know, there's cleaners, there's receptionist, mm-hmm. there's kennel techs, there's assistants, there's all these things that are part of the system. And so if you have an opportunity, if you're a one man or woman show to, you know, like, it's just, Know your demographic too. Know your market, because our market is the world. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's market is the world. It's their county of mm-hmm. the state that they live in. Yeah, and that's fine too. Mm-hmm. But knowing like what your market is too, and the other thing I would say is like just understanding that. For me, value is important as well. I but I think that that's that's too much of a like a given to me in the discussion of off like how do you make your car prices go up or what should you do it's more about the supply and demand of like how much money would it take for me to pay you to leave an hour of your wife and your family's time how much is that worth you know and that's like this, that's what I'm going to charge for this mm-hmm. and having but but also understanding that we love what we do so regardless of any success that we have over time on any level, whether it's financial or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. I think we love what we do and we're always going to want to do it, but we also have businesses to run. We have family and that's people don't, I shouldn't say that. I I think people listening sometimes don't understand the amount of businesses and amount of different things that we are responsible for. Mm -hmm. Like they just think, I show up and I train a dog with my videographer and then I go home and she puts it on YouTube. That would be, wouldn't that be nice? Lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah. But it's like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an unconceivable amount of work on a mental and physical way to not only run a business, but run brands and onlines and manage people and be a good husband and a good father and be a good friend and, and also keep your shit together. Yeah. And I think, anyway, my point is, is I think when you get to a certain point, like there is an advantage of not having many bills and not having any overhead at all and being able to cut your teeth on like a lower price just to gain some, cause that's like, if I were to talk to somebody right now and they were like, I want to start a dog training business. Um, I've been doing it on the side for five years. I have great handling skills. Everything I've done has been successful. I would almost say like, come out of the gate, if you don't have a lot of overhead, you don't have a facility, you don't have staff, you're doing this part-time to start, which is recommended um, for the majority of people who aren't 
completely obsessed like you and I and putting ourselves into situations where like if we don't make it, we won't eat. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. But if you have an opportunity to kind of start full time and many, 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 I would say 80% of dog trainers probably do that in the beginning or past that that's a great opportunity for you to like undercut your 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 competition to get a good word of mouth and a good foundation together where then you can compete or get past those people by then you have a foundation of like your community is like oh I've used cuz you post on you know you go to a Facebook group or something right and somebody's going to say like I have a dog and I have problems you're going to get in any given city, five people tagging five different people of like, they're the best go to them. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's how it goes. But what, what I sometimes and look at, will look at as a business owner as I'm like, how many times did I get tagged? Mm -hmm. Cause then I think as a consumer, that's likely the person you're going to go to, mm -hmm. or that's likely the person that you're probably going to call. I'm at a different point in my career now where that stuff I don't look at or that stuff doesn't mean as much to me because I'm completely separate from this company, completely separate um, business-wise. That's just my word of advice. That sometimes maybe going out there and undercutting just a little bit because you're just starting off and you want to gain a good word of mouth and over-delivering on value to get that word of mouth going is beneficial. Favorite smoked meat? I should let Abby answer this. Yeah, good question. Um, I've been doing brisket more recently, but I think it's too much. It's too it's sickly. I've been doing Wagyu brisket, though, so that mm. doesn't help. It's what about, much. like... I like pork. I do a lot of pulled pork. and That's your favorite? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Would that be your favorite to eat or your favorite to smoke? Oh, good question. No, my favorite to smoke is brisket. Okay. Because I really like... I rarely, I, I don't think I've ever done it just for myself. I'd never just cook. Part of the fun for me is doing it for other people. Um, there's, there is something cool about doing a big brisket for people, especially in the UK, because the, the likelihood is that they've never had it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's fun. So yeah. But if I was doing something for the family, but it's what I wanted to eat, I'd probably do pork. Mm. Still smoking? Yeah, just not as much. In the winter, it's harder. I'd say I'd dip off in the winter and then come March, April, it'll pick back up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to find a way to smoke cheese. Like I was just about to say smoked cream cheese. That's yeah. a staple. Oh, well, we had that because Freddie saw it on your Instagram yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. all we had for like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Freddie was like, you got to try this. Yeah. Smoked but, cream cheese with honey. Yeah. With honey and then like some seasoning on yeah. top. Season, season up the, the, cre the cream cheese first, smoke mm. it like a savory yeah, like a salty yes. yeah. yeah. And then hit it with some honey and then like a Ritz cracker. Game changer. I'll do brisket and it'll take like, it's like a 22 hour cook. Sure. And I've been like stayed up at night, setting my alarm to do it. Um, people will come and it's been like a, a work of art to get it right. That cream cheese, you just mm -hmm. put it on a bit of tin foil, sprinkle some stuff on, chuck it in for an hour, take it off, honey biscuits, and they go away. And they're like, that's the best thing I've ever had. That was amazing, Will. And the uh, brisket <laughs> goes by the wayside. Mm. Yeah. It is a great app for anybody that wants to do that. We have Traegers, or you probably have multiple smokers, right? I've got a Traeger pellet grill, and then I had this custom-built kind of Argentinian thing that was, more, that was more of a grill than a smoker. Um, I was getting into steaks and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're talking about. Uh, this is another question from Hello Bonds. How do you how do you stay motivated and keep going? I feel like fixing behavior is never ending. It's a good question. Um, for me, the the thing that excites me is finding create. I love the creative aspect of what we do in social media. I'm as much. Um, I love YouTube and video. Um, and kind of the art of video and stuff. So that's kind of, I'm lucky in that capacity because I could keep doing the behavior stuff, which I understand might at times feel like it's a bit of a hamster wheel of like, this is never ending. I'm, especially if you like me and you kind of a solution, a kind of my joke's always been kind of, I want to put myself out of business as a behaviorist. Hence like the proactive stuff. Like I want to help people not have problems in the first place and then they don't need me as a behaviorist. 
so for me, what keeps me excited, it's what we spent literally hours a day talking about is how do you, cool, the, the algorithms change. So how do we kind of create content that works now and, f and is educational and provides value, always value, value um, in new ways and leveling up gear and or purposefully leveling down gear uh, to make it more, all of that stuff I get really interested in. So that, that keeps it fun for me because that's um, an exciting challenge. The thing with the dog stuff is um, is the people side of it is the thing that I really enjoy that keeps, even if the cases, the behaviors feel like a bit of a hamster wheel, the emotions attached to the humans that you help, that never gets old to me, never. That's when people, as like you said earlier, when their jaws hit the floor um, of what you're able to do uh, and how that changes their lives, uh, that, that has yet to get old and I hope it doesn't yeah and I, I would say too just my two cents on that is um if you really love what you do with dogs and it's your passion and it's something that you feel deep down in your heart that like that's for me that's what it is there I mean I've said this on the record so many times that I feel like if I didn't work with dogs it would have been very selfish of me because of how easy it is for me to do it it's unbelievably like you know when I go to do a UK tour or a UK seminar, we have all these logistics, right, of flying six, seven people over f three different carts of luggage and production and, and lights and camera, the whole nine, and then the hotels and the Ubers, and you get it. Mm -hmm. The very last thing, right before I get to the venue, I'll go, I wonder what kind of dogs I'm going to work with, mm -hmm. right? So for me... If you really love working with dogs innately and you're, you know, and, and, and I, and I, again, I've said this before, it's like, I have like what, what, how I'm able to help dogs, how quickly I am is a gift and a gift. I don't like using that word cause it sounds a bit like showboating, but showboating, it, it's actually like the polar opposite. Really a gift is a gift. And, you know, whether it's from God or whatever is like, I, people always ask me, how did you get into this? I'm like, somebody's like, oh, my dog does this. And I'm like, boom. And it's like, it's an easy, it's like, I don't even have to think about it. And I'm sure you're the same way. And so my point is, is if you really are that type of person where you, you have this innateness to help animals at this level, you also have to understand that you will burn out if you don't delegate. And so if you, this question is kind of like, how do you stay motivated? How do you keep going? The end, the fixing behavioral problems in this question will never end. That's always going to be there. I don't, that's never going to end. But if you put yourself into a situation where it's never going to end, you will burn out. And this question will come up again and again and again until you really don't like what you do or you really don't want to show up to work anymore. And... You and I are at this point now in our careers where the production and the creation is what we really lean into so we don't burn out of other things. And it's equal, but it's exciting that we can reinvent ourselves constantly mm -hmm. because we have this creative like, oh, let's do this type of video. Mm -hmm. like I started getting into skits. You know, How can I help dog owners on every level? I'll just do a funny skit. I love that shit. Like, that makes me laugh. It makes me feel good. It's like... And so changing up like what you're doing but I think like in general if you're in a situation where you're finding yourself to be at this point where you're like is it ever going to end no it's never going to end and you have two different options you either um, become a manager and you hire somebody and you step in to train every now and then or every other week or whatever like you have to delegate um, so they have to just set themselves up to a point where like you and I have these businesses, right? This is a good point for this person. You and I have these businesses of all these different dog related things and all these employees and stuff. But how, how many dogs a month do you work, right? Like for me, it's maybe like one or two or three because we, we have our hands in so many other things, but we still are building businesses around dogs because we've delegated for different things and some days I'd love to just come down here and grab a couple dogs out of the kennel because I love what I do but we also have to do so much other stuff so I think my my suggestion also is you you 
you don't if you're asking yourself this question now you're on the road to burnout <laughs> right that's where i was about to jump in because i think there's like the it go I, I mentioned it earlier around why i kind of it was it was a big deal for me i think to kind of step out and talk about finances within the industry but this is the reason genuinely the ethical reason as i think it's going to help people is to prevent that so when i said earlier how i think dog trainers can and should strive for six figures for that reason so I talked about it like last week I had a crazy filming week and I love filming and I was driving to the airport and I was like I think I'm done I'm done I can't it took 12 hours I was like I've got some more ideas I'm excited to get back I'm looking forward to, I just needed a break I just needed a day for me it was a day away from it um and I think even if and I don't think that means that you don't love it I think it just need, means that you just needed a bit of a break. Nobody can do the same thing that they love over and over. I don't smoke brisket. If I smoke briskets every single day, seven days a week, it doesn't mean I don't love it, but I think it would wear on me. Um, and maybe some people are that kind of obsessed by like so many things that if I'm doing one thing and I can't then do other things yeah. that, I mean, that I enjoy, it makes me slightly resentful of the only thing that I'm doing, even if the only thing I'm doing is one of the many things I love, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. But I think if you build the business side of it smartly and intelligently so that you can have maybe less clients that helps you prevent burnout so that you can have, I know dog trainers that don't have time off. They can't afford to take weeks off. Right, yeah. And I think it's really important that if you're doing, especially if you kind of doing more traditional 60, 90 minute consultations and you grind in three, four of them a day, six days a week. And I know them and they are the, like I've helped them when they've burnt out and they're the people that I know handle, they love what they do, but they burn out. And I said, like, you need a break. I'm like, I can't afford to take a break, Will, because I can't pay my rent. I'm like, okay, well, we need right. to work on, your, there's something wrong here then in the business. You're either personally spending way too much money and that needs to be addressed, or you're just not making enough money to allow you to take the break that you need to r make sure that it remains something that you love. Because that's something I've seen happen is people that I truly believe do love it became resentful of it because it created so much stress and nine times out of 10, the stress is financial. Yeah. And if you can just remove that stress, it's not because again, you want to be flexing on everyone on Instagram. You just remove that stress of my bills are paid this month and I need to take a week for my sanity and my mental health. And you can do that without it ruining your life it would be a solution to that problem. I know that's easy to say now, if you're not in that position, but you can be in that position. Um, and that's, again, podcasts like this and the stuff I do, the academy and stuff, that's what that's there to help achieve. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's like you want to get into something because you love it mm -hmm. and then you get it mm -hmm. and then you're like, I can't get out. You yeah. get stuck. Mm -hmm. And we've, I think it just happens. But, but I also think like don't, <clears throat> don't, people put too much pressure on themselves where or they jump too early or maybe they're not ready to do it full time yet. Mm. So I think that's another thing too is if you ease into it, especially if you have a responsibility as the bread bread bringer in her, <laughs> money maker, if that makes sense. It worked. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, you have a responsibility of bills to pay. Mm. You, you Okay, being a good dog trainer is one thing, but running a successful business. I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah. People don't get that until they do it like you can love training dogs and hate be miserable at running the business and the idea of filing taxes and accounting and bookkeeping and mm -hmm. shout out to our wives right uh, exactly amen <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think it's just part of it too you don't it's just you know it's it's um it's just you find the yin to your you know you have joe i have abby you have yeah. H, I have taylor it's like we we have a team of people that it's hard to explain, but it's like there is a there is it takes a team, it takes a village to build something as big as mm -hmm. what you and I are doing. And and when I say as big, reaching as many people on every platform, it's not just like you're a TikToker, mm -hmm. you're a YouTuber, you're a this. It's like we we are we've been able to sustainably shift platforms and build a, a, a um. Uh, you know, a really great community on every platform that we've done, whether it's podcasting, mm -hmm. Facebook or whatever. And it's like, 
that's that is really making an impact. That's what I mean by that, I think, as big. When I say as big, I don't mean like numbers on the screen. I mean as like as impactful. How impactful are you? Value, providing value at yeah. scale internationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get into a dog training question here. It's like tips for managing dog to dog resource guarding in multi-dog home. It's like the one dog training question I'll ask you. Yeah, no, I think it's cool. The, my brain instantly then, it's just curious. I was like, I find it interesting where my brain immediately goes to when I hear those questions is um, better management initially uh, of what is it that those dogs are resource guarding and is there things that we can do just immediately that stop setting them up to fail? Nine times out of 10 for me, if it's resource guarding, it's food. So is food being left down all the time that they can have free access to? Well, that, that just shouldn't be done anyway. So remove that. Um, that's an interesting question of like management versus kind of actually fixing the problem. But if they're resource guarding over their dog bowls and we just don't leave their dog bowls down or feed them separately, is that and it fixes the problem and therefore you never see resource guarding again. It doesn't necessarily mean that that dog now doesn't resource guard. It would if you put it back in that situation, but if for the rest of its life, it's never gonna be able to be in that situation. Is that okay? And is that enough? I think earlier on in my career, I'd be like, no, I need to fix it. And I think the older I've got and the more clients I've worked with and the more you realize, not realize, but the more you understand that what we may be able to achieve easier can be very difficult for owners to do and I'm using much more management strategy training now than I used to for that reason to just try and set owners up for success so I've gone way off on a tangent there that's good um, yeah I would like more details I know you haven't got them but that that's kind of where my mind goes yeah that's why I, I it's hard for me to answer those types of questions because there's so much context that needs to be um, addressed but yeah I mean you know same thing is I would just say uh, one thing I'd add is just the control that you have. You know, like if you have two dogs that are fighting over food, that's not like, oh, that's crazy. Really? That's weird. Why? Mm -hmm. It's more about like, okay, that's happening. How much control do you have? Where's your obedience? Yeah, then it goes all the way up to foundations. Yeah. Like all dogs need. Right. And many don't have. It's like every consult that you and I will ever do. Yeah. Is I have back this to what the behavior is. 100%. Yeah, we go back to the, okay, well, let's do all of this first. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, that fixes the problem. If it doesn't, well, now we can go into the micro of what the problem was because oftentimes that was the symptom to yeah. the bigger problem. Um, if you fix the bigger problem, then the symptom disappears. Yep, 100%. Like every single, and it's becoming more and more, but um, okay. A couple people just saying that you're their hero and, they want to meet us, and so that's good. Shout out to those people. Um, another question. This is an interesting question that I, I think I talked about last podcast too, but how would you change your business if it became slip lead only? And I know you're pretty much slip lead only, aren't you? Or yeah, slip lead's my go-to. Um, I like slip collars. Um, Femur is about to release some, so I've been the last 12 months been kind of prototyping uh, and getting them perfect for me before we then release them through Fenrir. So I've been using them a lot more. If what they, what people I think mean by that question is what would it do to my business if prong collars and e-collars were made illegal? And again, my thing has always been, that's not my hill to die on. Like nothing changes for me. Not that nothing changes. I've got many tools in my toolbox and I'm always trying to add new tools um, kind of literally or metaphorically. Um, I just, What's your number? Your number one is slip, yeah? Yeah, yeah, slip and then prong. Um, and I'm, I've, I, there's a lot of, it's been just an interesting experiment for myself if I was like to, there's certain dogs not to blow my own trumpet. I know kind of, if we, and again, like you were saying earlier, it's, people have made similar accusations to me of I'm just a tool guy, I just slap a, tool on every dog and that's the, all I know how to do it's more a case of the, the types of dogs I work with right. tend to be dogs that that is the behavior modification plan that's required and the reason I take on those cases like I said earlier there's not many people in the UK that can do it and if a dog needs more basic obedience with food work I'd just send them somewhere else to mm -hmm. do that rather than come to me just to give context to that question but there's dogs that come in that I'm like a prong collar would you're never certain are you but you know I'm I'd do that really quickly with a prong collar, but I've got time and I know the clients would always in the UK ideally not use one. So I've been trying to really harness my skills of, um, of slip leads and slip collars 
with the understanding that kind of the prong collar's there if needed. Um, so I've almost just kind of been testing myself to try and really master that tool, um, which has kind of been my personal kind of challenge yeah. and journey over the last kind of six to 12 months. Um, yeah, uh, but the genuine, so not the answer to that question. I'll use whatever's needed to solve the problem in front of me. Um, when I've got time, I'll go lower down the tool kind of hierarchy and know I can build up if need be. Um, in answer to that question, if if that happened, there will be some dogs that um, the level of kind of change we were able to make won't be as much as yeah. if the tools were legal. Um, again, it's not my hill to die on of to scream a shout about that because it won't change it. I, I have meetings and stuff on kind of the back end of the politician-y type stuff and working on on that and, and people are interested in my opinion on it. So I, I give it where it's needed. But um, yeah, I think too many trainers get locked into that as well of and then create content on not just using the tools because that's content I've made and I think it's important to show proper usage of these tools that kind of uh, we both do, but kind of be like angrily and aggressively defending the tools mm-hmm. um, or having arguments with the other side. It's just not something that I've ever wanted to do. Um, I help in any way that I can. And if they were banned, um, it would be a shame. And then you just deal with it and roll with it and do the best you can, which is, again, I think they will be, which is one of the reasons why I was like, I need to become a master of this tool rather than just um, always going up the hierarchy. Because I'm very not maybe I am pessimistic, but I'm leaning towards I do think in the UK they will be banned um, and therefore I would rather get ahead of it now because I've genuinely looked at it and I don't think there's anything I could do to stop that from happening. And if I thought I could, I would. I don't think I can. So I would rather put that time and energy into becoming masterful with the tools that will be left. Um, And right now, I always do that with the caveat of knowing that if that doesn't work, though, I still have access to these other tools up the hierarchy if I need them. And hopefully that will remain the case. And if it doesn't, cross that bridge when I come to it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, I, I have a remote collar of my own that I did with Dogcha. So, um, if it came down to, ha- um, you know, like uh, the question is, how would you change your business if it became slip lead only? I wouldn't. I think that the only downside to using slip leads to, like, if if the government on any level in any country were to say this is the only tool that you can use they're basically saying this is the only way that anybody should be able to train dogs regardless of your skill set your size your capabilities your disabilities anything the only thing that they would do is hurt more dogs it's always the dogs that suffer always the dogs will suffer immensely because of this and for me it's not going to change much i may say like we we're probably not going to do private training anymore then mm-hmm. Because the amount of people, like, again, like, here, here's, here's, here's the genuine thing that happens, okay? You get a family that gets a dog. This dog turns out to be this 60 to 80 pound dog. They have soccer practice. They have ballet. They have lunch. They have dinners. They have recitals. They have all these things going on. And now the dog can't be walked because the owners don't have enough time or energy to train the dog. And then they come into training and they're, the kids are got the goldfish going everywhere and there's juice being spilled and they're, yeah, okay. And they're doing everything that they can. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, let's try this prong collar and then they're able to walk their dog. They can come home at night and walk their dog. And if they didn't have that training and they didn't have that tool, they wouldn't have been able to walk their dog. And so for me, it's not so much about what I would do differently. I would just say like these owners that are doing shuffling all these different things aren't going to be able to put in the real work that's needed to train this particular dog with a piece of rope. Right. And it, and so by using a prong collar, using a tool to help, I've used this, I've used this uh, type of um, analogy many times, but we could all say that we could build a house with a hammer and a nails because they used to build houses with mud. We can we can write a letter to Will in the UK and say, "Hey man, thanks for a really great time," or "Hey man, I left my shoes in your car. Do you think you could maybe let me know if they're in there?" And I mail it out to you, and then two weeks later, I get something back that says. 
no, bro, they're not in here. And I say, okay. And I mail something back like, but now we have WhatsApp and now we have email and now we have social media. So the changes that we've made over the years has benefited all of our lives considerably on every level and every aspect. So as the tools um, become better and become more accessible, there's education that goes involved, which is what you and I do for a living. Because again, like I could make a hundred videos on how to train a puppy, how to sit or how to train a puppy, not to nip your heels and how to train a puppy to stay. But that, that information is something that is not something that everybody needs proprietary. Anybody can do that for the most part. Mm -hmm. Any dog trainer should be able to do those fundamental things. Mm -hmm. What I like my passion in putting out content is about is things that people aren't going to be able to go down the road and these people are going to be comfortable with. And if they, they're going to put a prong collar on anyway. They're, good, they're likely going to get an e-collar anyway. My job, your job, is to say if you're going to do it, this is how to do it. And that's been, again, like, I don't want to be, like, that's something that I've seen is like, that's the tool guy. I'm like, I'm the tool guy that's teaching you how to use the tools because there's plenty of people out there that's doing basic obedience and, and, and that's the easy part, in my opinion. But the hard part is, is how do you get a dog that's really not fitting into that and is kind of aggressive, a little bit dangerous, and they need a prong collar because my wife is 100 pounds soaking wet. When I had a 165-pound dog, that wanted to chase a squirrel, would I just say like, don't, you can't walk the dog and because I'm in LA and now my dog's sitting there like, can I go for a walk? I'm like, unfortunately not because you physically can't hold that dog. You physically can't hold on to that dog. But then we use a prong collar that the dog responds to so much more effectively, like by a hundred percent. And if those things are taken away because of other people's opinions on them that they don't understand, like many, the majority of 99.9% .9 of people who are against tools have never touched, seen, or used one in their life. So it's really easy to look at something and go, you know what? This looks bad. Therefore, you're right. We shouldn't do that. And that's the big problem, I think, is if people really just understood that these tools are necessary for a lot of dog owners out there that are struggling with getting their kids to school on the bus on time it's not going to affect my business. It's not going to take money out of my pocket, right? But what it's going to do is it's going to change how dogs are trained in the U.S. and there's going to be a lot more frustration. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot more dogs euthanized. There's going to be a lot more dogs in shelters because these people aren't professional dog trainers. So you could say, and I can say, like if I get in a really aggressive dog or I get a dog that is a challenge, you and I can spend two weeks or a week fundamentally, you know, working with this dog and we're going to see drastic results, but not, no, but nobody, none of our clients have that time. Mm -hmm. They're single moms, they're busy people, they're traveling, they're working, they're CEOs, they're quarterbacks of a Super Bowl winning team that, you know, it, it's, they're so busy. They do not have the time to learn how to be a dog trainer. They're going into the store and they're saying like, Hey, I'm not a chef, but can you make me a sandwich? Sure, I can. Here you go. So I, I and I get this question a lot, and, it, and it's kind of frustrating to even see because it's like it's not going to take money out of my pocket. It's like it's not going to. I'm not going to be. It's just going to be frustrating for our clients. The dogs are going to suffer immensely because of it. And and that's the thing. Like if you really cared about dogs, you would see that nine to one are people. The, the people who are using tools are benefiting from these tools. The dogs are off leash and running around. The people who couldn't walk their dogs are now walking their dogs safely and effectively with their kids and their family with a prong collar. And the usage is being done correctly and humanely. And th those are the things that some people aren't looking at. And so it wouldn't affect my business. It would just hurt my clients tremendously. And you could argue, well, then you're not a good trainer. But I can tell you right now by working boots on the ground seven days a week for over a decade – the people that come in are just normal people that are trying to get their dog that's pulling them on the leash to stop. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not going to be able to do that with a piece of string because they don't fundamentally have the skill sets or ability to do it. And they don't have the time to learn how to be a dog trainer to do it. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir. Another Because another thing that... So one of the other reasons, again, my thing of being proactive and trying to... Uh, stop people finding themselves in the situation where this is a problem in the first place is because I think there's some dogs that are just better suited to not needing those tools um, and again if those tools are banned then the 
types of dogs that people have i think should massively change to reflect that um but that won't happen again it's it's one of those things you everybody that knows me will know my thoughts on this um on this topic and you've just summarized it beautifully so i won't add to it because we're certainly very aligned on on it um but it, it just goes back to my thing of it'll be the dogs that suffer um yeah. and well, just I don't know what to like say. Like I'm the same. How would it impact my business? Not much. Yeah. The, the dogs I work with, I'll still try and work with. The results won't might not to be as. There'll be some. Obviously, some dogs don't need those tools anyway. So those tool those dogs will remain to have high levels of success. The dogs that needed those tools will have lower levels of success. Mm -hmm. um, my business won't change. Um, we'll continue to do all the stuff we're doing. Um, what will change will be the dogs will suffer more. Yeah, it's, it's like it's just like banning training wheels for bikes. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the people who know how to ride a bike aren't going to be troubled at all. They're not even know the rules changed. One it's of the main things I use tools for is um, I call it bridging the gap, uh, and because it's, it's something I've been thinking about a lot whilst trying to master this kind of stuff that I think will remain legal and. There's, there's certain dogs where even for me it's been a challenge. I'm like, oh, if this is challenging for me, there is no way the owner is right. going to be able to get there. Um, and there's some dogs where I'm like, I get there with this tool, but I'm like, that was work and required impeccable timing and levels. And my assertive, confident nature came in involved with that. And yeah, and again you try and hand that over to and you know they can't do it and you move over to a tool and it bridges that gap um so that that makes me nervous that my ability to be able to bridge the gap of my right. experience and skill set will be gone um mm -hmm. it's yeah i suppose it is a topic i'm slightly pessimistic about um but yeah it just i also don't want to be paralyzed by the pessimism of it i want to try and remain upbeat and positive and be always moving forward right now they're not banned so it's like not it's kind of like i'll cross that bridge when i come to it and when i if and when i come to that bridge i'll try and cross that bridge as positively and yeah. as effectively as i try and work out what that is and then as and when i work out what that is i will try and pass that on to other trainers that are struggling mm -hmm. um, and try and help them cross that bridge with me um and it's kind of all being a solutions person i don't ever like to just wallow in what ifs or problems it's like there are no problems or any solutions. Um, and right now that's yeah. kind of just, yeah, crack on. Yeah. I just think mm -hmm. the, I think if they ban tools, uh, that ban will be lifted quick. But that, that's been what's happened in the UK. So there were uh, remote collars were banned in Wales. Um, and I'm not hundred percent if the ban has been lifted, I believe it has, or it's about to be because, um, attacks on livestock, <laughs> through the roof yeah. so then farmers started rallying against it and then people were like oh okay yeah. this so that would be an optimistic opinion of if um if they did get banned that that statistics would follow very quickly afterwards yeah. that then hopefully people would be like okay cool i think um we'll re look at this yeah it'll be it'll be a state thing mm -hmm. so the shelters are already full yeah so then let's think about it you take you take just a regular everyday person who doesn't have what you and I have to work with dogs on a fundamental innate level. And then you'd give a dog with a problem because people aren't coming in without problems, mm -hmm. right? We see dogs coming in with problems. You'd bring a dog in that has a problem. And now your only opportunity is to train this everyday person that has, again, two jobs and three kids and is worried more about the soccer practice and who's going to make dinner tonight, mom or dad. And then you're like, you have to now use this piece of string to train this dog that is out of control. So then what's going to happen is, is the shelters are going to be even more of a run at a local level mm -hmm. and the state is going to have to youth. And so it's not even going to be about like, man, we're killing a lot of dogs. It's going to be about how much money is this costing us to kill these dogs? That, that. And then the ban will come off yeah. because they're going to realize that as soon as they ban certain tools that don't allow dog owners at a basic level to control their dogs, the shelters are going to be overrun. And the, the cost of euthanizing dogs is going to skyrocket and it's going to be day and night. Yeah. I could imagine within six months, they're going to see this mm. go straight up. I'd bet the house on that. And yeah. 
Yeah. That's what's going to happen. And, and then I think, that, and they're going to go, hmm, I wonder why this is, why is it costing us so much money for all these needles to be putting these dogs down? And then, and then what are they going to do with the bodies? Mm -hmm. And then what are they going to do with the collars? And then what, it's a whole thing, mm -hmm. right? It's a whole business. And then, um, the drug, the, there's going to be new drugs coming out and then the behaviors are good. They're, they're going to be running out of ink, mm -hmm. right? And that's, what's going to end up happening. It's going to be this whole thing. It's about all about balance. You can't, t mm -hmm. you can't just take away something because you don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. Because there's there's a bigger percentage of people out there that are utilizing these things to help them out, mm -hmm. and and that's what's gonna that's in my opinion that's what will happen. But who knows? Uh, who knows? We'll see. Um, all right. I don't know how long we've been talking, Will, but I um, a feeling it was over an hour. Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find Will in the description everywhere. Yeah. And big big shout out to our wives for. The biggest of shout outs. Yeah, letting us. It's like, hey, Rach, you want to go to New York? <laughs> <laughs> Sit and listen to me and you talk for four days. At least there's good food involved sometimes yeah. for him. And there's cute babies. That that helps. That softened the blow, I think. Yeah. But you get baby cuddles if you come. Yeah. So it's been great. Um, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, you can follow Will with all the stuff below. And uh, Will has agreed to also come out to my UK seminar that we're going to do this year that's become an annual thing. Shout out to Holly and Jill um, for being great liaisons and hosts. So Will will be at my seminar doing a little bit more hands-on work this year, hopefully. And you guys can see us out there this fall. Can't wait. Cool. Cheers. Cheers. Crack on. Happy days.